Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is the kickoff meeting for uh, the peer review of the East Coast Surficial Model. And uh, I was, we did a dry run of this presentation and uh, I was very short and sweet and I realized last night that I needed to spend a little bit more time. And that's because this is truly a team effort. Um, we need to go back 20, 30 years ago you know, in terms of development of DB Hydro and our regulation database. Uh, and even before that, um, folks like uh, Steve Krupa, uh, who leads up the hydrogeology unit, in terms of amassing all the information that made its way into DB Hydro and the regulatory database. Without that, we don't have a model. And so there was some really forward thinking folks 30 years ago that suggested that we develop out those types of corporate databases that allowed us to be in a position to actually do something like we're talking about doing today. And I'd like to recognize uh, that. Um, this is a groundwater model and we have a groundwater modeling unit, but we touch a lot of different groups within this agency in order, once again, to get us to where we are. Um, I mentioned the hydrogeology group that did a lot of well installation and aquifer tests and water level monitoring, which again made its way into DB Hydro. We have a groundwater technical analysis unit that consists of programmers and data scientists. And we're gonna be hearing a lot about that today in terms of the program efforts that we needed to do in order to get where we're at today, in order to meet our schedule and to have a product that actually can solve some of the issues that we have. And, uh, and, and then again, finally, a, a lot of staff from the groundwater modeling unit to get us there. Also, um, our partners in the hydrology and hydraulics bureau, they're gonna be providing the boundary conditions from the South Florida water management model uh, to support uh, this effort, as we, especially during calibration and for the predictive scenarios. Um, the US Geological Survey, we've had a cooperative agreement with them for, I don't know, 50 something years. And uh, they have collected a lot of water level and fluoride information from monitor wells throughout uh, the area of this model domain and beyond. And again, without that, all that data, we can't do what we're talking about doing here. Um, and then I'd like to recognize three particular individuals on our team that uh, have just been in incredible. Uh, Jeff Giddings, uh, who recently uh, retired from the district in December and uh, is foregoing his FRS pension to come back and help us uh, during this effort. It's just a uh, it gives you a, an idea of his dedication to you know, what we're trying to do here. Um, we wouldn't be here today without Kevin Romper, who has taken CWAT and bolted on uh, the wetlands package and a couple of other district specific packages. And we have a new version of CWAT that we'll be using. And we're gonna be talking about that at length today in order to assure the panel that we have a functioning version of CWAT that can do what we needed to do for this particular model. And then last but not least is our project manager, Mushi obi Sakara, who uh, just impresses me every day. Uh, she is you know, steering this ship. I, and I, I use that phrase specifically because this is our flagship project. Um, this, this area that we're talking about in terms of the model, I think it covers like 7 million people. And you know, when this is done and we start applying it for future water supply plans, and you know, with this functionality, we're going to be able to do something we've never done before or had the capability of, which is to simulate, explicitly simulate sea level rise and consider climate change. We've never been able to do that before, but that's what you know society is demanding of us to address those questions specifically. And we have Dr. Carolina Moran, who's leading up our resiliency efforts here. And you know we're going to be working closely with her to try to develop scenarios that answer some of those questions. So it's really an exciting time for, for the district. And I think this is going to be, at least on the groundwater modeling side, this is our flagship project. And you know we're really looking forward to getting a lot of input from the panel. I will tell you that we've been doing peer reviews on our groundwater models for over 15 years now. And I will tell you that every time we've convened a panel, we have learned things. And what you're, you're gonna to see today is a product of that learning. We have leveraged all of those recommendations from previous panels to get us to where we are today. Um, one last thing about the, the whole peer review process. In the past, uh, what we did was we would do this model, we would put a documentation together, 
we would convene a panel, we get all these recommendations, and guess what? We'd have to redo the model and redo the documentation. Well, we learned in the Central Florida experience not to do that. And so where, we're, where we are today is we have done all of the legwork and we are now right at the process of beginning the calibration phase. So we have uh, a model, we have a grid, we have boundary conditions, we have compiled virtually all the data, but we haven't hit the go button on anything to do with the, the really meaty stuff, which is the calibration. So you're going to hear a lot. You're going to have a lot of information presented today. And we're going to be presenting our calibration strategy, and we want to get input from you about the data that we need, our calibration strategy, what's achievable in this model domain. It's a regional model. We can't have the same level of calibration performance that we would for a model that's uh, modeling uh, a gas station site with an underground storage tank. We need to consider a regional model of this scale. And as I, I don't know if I said before, there's 7 million people probably in this model domain. So there's a lot riding on this. And we're really looking forward to uh, each of you as panel members and collectively as the panel to really dive into what we're doing here. Um, this, this is the kickoff meeting. We're gonna have a second meeting in a couple of months just to give you an update on the progress. Then, you know, once calibration is complete, we will reconvene and talk about what we were able to achieve. Hopefully we're able to achieve all our objectives. There may be some areas that we, we can't for different reasons because of data quality. Um, you will see that we've converted all of the, we have our regulatory database has chloride, specific inductance, TDS, all the things, those all need to be converted to a common format, which in our case is total dissolved solids. There's some error when you convert <laughs> Some of those parameters, we use great regression equations, which are, we're going to talk about today, but there's some error associated with some of those conversions. And all of that needs to be considered when we come up with our criteria, because this is the data that we have. We don't have uh, a monitor well every 100 feet you know, throughout this entire model domain. We've got good coverage. Um, it's, it's focused more to the east compared to the west, but that's probably appropriate for what, you know, where, where we really are, our focus is. So, that was a lot longer than the version of the dry run, but I just really wanted to recognize, you know, the staff that have contributed to this effort and will continue to do so. And we really look forward to working with you as panelists and, and for those that are calling in, appreciate you logging in and I hope you'll follow along uh, with uh, the process that we have over the next several months. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Alicia. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Alicia McGlow, and um, today's meeting will be broken into two sessions. In the morning, we're going to be going over the peer review process. Uh, we're going to be going over the model, overview of the model, all of the specialized district packaging that we use in the model, the hydrostratigraphy used in the model, as well as the salt water intrusion mapping, and the sea water modification. Um, that we did to the C1 code. At the end of that, we're going to open it up to the panel for discussion. However, panelists, please note that while we present, you can stop us along the way and ask questions. We encourage it. And after the panel um, discussion, we're then going to open it up to the public for comment. In the afternoon, we're going to be starting off with um, going over the ET recharge and return flow program, uh, the input data sets used in the model, also our proposed model calibration plan and calibration of criteria. And again, we'll open it up for panel discussion. And as we go in the morning, you can stop us along the way. And um, at the end of the panel discussion, we'll open up to the public for comment. So the peer review process. The peer review process is an independent evaluation of work products by individuals with similar competencies as the producers of the work of the products. Um, it involves the soliciting of feedback regarding decisions on input data and assumptions, methodology, and resulting work products. And this peer review process will be conducted through a dedicated uh, web board. And um, all of our documents and correspondence will also be posted and shared on the web board. Uh, this is the web link uh, for the web board. Our panelists, you have 
this link. I provided it to you in the email that I sent. And so um, as we go through this process, we'll be posting um, a lot of reports and model up the data sets for you guys to review and provide your feedback on. Just note that if you're using this web board for the first time, it will prompt you, you have to have a username and password to log in. So um, on the website, you can, there's a little option below to click to create an account. And once you do that, you shouldn't have any issues logging in. All right, so the role of the pair, um, what the pair review panelists has to do is to evaluate the overall appropriateness of the model and answer the following questions. Was the model developed using good modeling practices? Did the model address peer review comments to the extent possible? Did the model achieve reasonable calibration statistics? And can the model be applied for its intended purpose? So your duty as panelists is to conduct the reviews of the conceptual model, the calibration plan, model input data sets, model calibration, sensitivity analysis and documentation. You're also tasked to evaluate the suitability of the model for water supply planning, scenario evaluation, and groundwater availability, and to continue to participate in upcoming meetings and workshops. As Pete said, we'll have another um, review meeting here in the next couple of months, and we'll keep you posted on the timeline when, we're, when we'll be scheduling this, these meetings. So this is just an overview of the East Coast Official Model Task Timeline. So um, the model team, um, we're expecting to complete model conceptualization and calibration strategy by the end of this month. And the panelists are expected to um, review and provide comments on these by October of 2022. Uh, the transient data sets and calibration status. Uh, we're hoping to have that done by December of 2022 um, with the panel to provide their comments and feedback by January 2023. Uh, final model calibration results, we're hoping to have that in March of 2023 and the panelists to provide their feedback by April of 2023. And then finally, the model <laughs> calibration report we're hoping to have that completed by July of 2023, and the panelists provide your feedback and comment by August of 2023. So serving on our panel, we have Dr. Wishing Go. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and he'll be serving as our panel chair. Dr. Wishing is a groundwater modeling specialist and hydrogeologist of Groundwater Tech Inc. located in Naples, Florida. He is a licensed professional geologist, geologist of Florida with over 30 years of experience in groundwater flow and solid transport modeling with expertise in the impact assessments of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion along the coastal areas. Thank you, Dr. Wishing, for serving on our panel today. Thank you. Also on our panel is Dr. Wendy Graham. She is the Swisher Eminent Scholar and Director at the University of Florida Water Institute. She is a hydrologist and her research focuses on integrated hydraulic modeling, including groundwater resources evaluation and remediation, evaluation of impacts of agricultural production on surface and groundwater quality, evaluation of impacts of climate variability and climate change on hydraulic systems, and st so, sorry, stochastic modeling and data assimilation. Thank you, Wendy, for serving on our panel. And then also serving as Dr. Michael Sukoff. He has been a professor in Earth Sciences, Earth and Environment at Florida International University since 2003, and has published two books, nearly 60 papers, and numerous government reports. He is a fellow of the Ge Geological Society of America, and is a licensed professional geologist in California and Kentucky, and a certified hydrogeologist in California. Thank you too for participating on today's panel. And on our East Coast modeling team, I would just like to introduce everybody on the team. So we have Anushio Basakero, uh, Yerglem Asagin, David Butler, Sean Paul, Jagat. Vitanagi, 
Kevin Rudberg, Brian Moore, Jose Grisales, Alicia McGlaw, and Stacey Coons, all serving on our East Coast modeling team. And uh, the district has also contracted with uh, Jeff Kiddens of Trade Winds Group, LLC. And he's going to be providing um, technical support and um, help during our um, modeling um, exercise here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nushi to give us an overview of the ECS. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'll be presenting the model overview for the East Coast official model, starting with the objectives. So we have two main objectives that we're trying to uh, meet for ECFM. The first is that we want to be able to evaluate the water supply demands for both planning regions. In the purple, you see the Upper East Coast planning region, which covers Martin and St. Lucie and a portion of Okeechobee County. And then in the green, you see the Lower East Coast planning region, which covers Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and then a small portion of um, Eastern Hendry, Eastern Collier, and Monroe counties. So we wanna make sure that we can meet the water supply planning um, needs for that 20 year planning horizon without undue effects on the existing legal users of water and natural systems. And then as Pete mentioned, we're also looking at using this model um, to simulate and evaluate the effects of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion on the groundwater system. So the East Coast official model. The first thing we talked about was, okay, we have two planning regions along the East Coast. We wanna make sure we have a boundary that covers both of those, but we didn't wanna have the boundary just along the Northern part of St. Lucie County. So what we did was we said, okay, for the Northern boundary, let's, uh, we set it to Bureau Beach, State Road 60 kind of cuts across right that, right through that area. And there's a small canal that goes across that area too. So we have a hydrologic boundary there. On the East Coast, we have the Atlantic Ocean where we can get tidal conditions from. So we have another boundary on the East Coast. On the West Coast, we're actually going north along the L2 Canal, which is on that um, Western side of the boundary. And then we cut north. So we're almost tracking along the Kissimmee River in the Northern portion. And then the L2 canal is actually just south of Lake Okeechobee, and we kind of follow it down to the south. And then our southern border is down in, in Marathon. So we cover, you know, a very large region of, of the east coast of Florida. The next thing we talked about is the calibration period of record. And so what we said was we would like to have 1985 to 2012 for the calibration. Yes, sir. Uh, so is the domain boundary the, the rectangle rather than the irregular uh, boundary? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The blue shows the, domain, the model domain. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the calibration period record is 1985 to 2012. The reason we're going back so far is because we want to use this model to tackle saltwater intrusion. And a lot of the intrusion happened in the 90s. So we wanted to go back before that intrusion happened, capture where the salt water front was in the 80s and see that the model can tackle the intrusion that's happened in the 90s, whether it's moving inland. In some cases, we actually saw it, it moved inland and then it moved back. So we wanna make sure the model can tackle all that. Um, our verification period of record is 2013 to 2016. I'm sure one of the questions is, why did you end in 2016? We're in 2022. And this is actually to be consistent with the um, South Florida water management model that the h, &H Bureau has, because as Pete mentioned, we're gonna be getting boundary conditions from them when we do the model application. So we wanted our timelines to end at the same date. Yes. Yeah. And you mean the two by two basically? Yes. The two okay. by two. We are looking at a daily stress period model for that entire time period. Um, so it's about, I think 12,000, stress periods. Our cell size is a thousand feet by a thousand feet. That's pretty consistent with what we did in the lower West Coast. And the models actually are almost right next to each other. There's a small overlap, but um, the cell size is pretty consistent with what we've done. We are also having five model layers to represent the superficial aquifer system. And Stacy will be talking about the model layering um, so we can more detail. And then for calibration, we are actually going to be calibrating to water levels, which will be a daily um, check. 
our water quality, which will be a total dissolved solids in milligram per liter. We're going to do that on a monthly basis. And then for structure flows, we've actually found um, that it's best to do a 30 day rolling average. A lot of this area is heavily managed. And so with that daily stress period, we can't capture the, the decision making to some days, you know, we'll send a lot of water. Another day we won't send any water. Some days we reverse flow in certain structures. So that 30 day rolling average seems to be the best fit for when we're trying to capture the overall way the system works. I have a quick question. Sure. Have you ever considered having one model for the whole so you eliminate the need for that interior boundary condition? We have not. Um, yeah, we, we've never actually considered that. I think it's a lot of it is data concerns. We're looking at, um, and I'll get into some of the packages that we use to manage that. But this model right now, as it is, I think takes about 12 hours to run. Um, and so right now we're focusing on migrating everything to CWAT. Once we do that, we can probably think about, okay, what is the data limit that we need? We always run into storage issues. There's a lot of stuff like that that we have to consider. And then the ET and recharge data set is, right now we migrated to binary, but without the binary, we were looking at needing almost a terabyte of data just to house this model. So. Might mention also the hydrogen security is quite a bit different. Very different. Than West Coast yeah. So the next part was the code selection. And this is something we spent a lot of time on. When we first started conceptualizing the model, this was about, I think, two and a half years ago. And so we knew we needed to meet the objectives of ECFM, but we weren't sure what code we wanted to use to do that. So one of the things that we did was I called Joe Hughes and Chris Langevin and I said, hey, what do you think? I know ModFlow 6 is out there. Where is it with the transport capabilities? And Chris said, yeah, it's in the works, but I can't tell you when it's going to be complete. And so at that point, you know, and when we first talked, we were hoping to have this kind of up and running in 2021, finishing in 2022. And they couldn't commit that, that ModFlow 6 would have transport at that time. Um, the other issue that we faced was, you can see on the, um, on the map, that's all of the contiguous wetlands we have. So we knew we needed to have some code that was capable of simulating all the contiguous wetlands, the operational rules within the canal network, the STAs, the water conservation areas, all of that. We needed some kind of way to do that. And the way we've modeled those particular areas in the past is using our district special packages, which I will talk a little bit more about later on. And we also knew we needed the transport capability to tackle sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. So given the fact that we weren't able to get a commitment on when Modulo 6 would be having that transport capability, and we knew we had the skill set in-house with Kevin, to modify CWA and add on the packages that we needed. We chose to go with CWA version four um, and update it with the district packages. And Kevin's gonna go into that in more detail. So those district packages that I talked about, what are they and what are they good for? So the first of them is the wetland package. Um, the wetland package was developed by Rishkrepo et al. in 1998. <laughs> It was designed to work with the block center flow package. And so uh, it was originally designed to work with Modflow 96. Later on, we migrated it over to um, work with our CWAT 2000, but it stayed in the BCF package. That's how it worked. So we knew that to work with CWAT, we wanted it in LPF. So that was part of the work that Kevin did. Um, but to the nice thing about the wetland package is that it simulates surface water flow and the surface water groundwater interaction in the wetland areas. So the top layer, depending on whether the water level in that layer one cell goes above topo or goes, you know, underground, it kicks on whether or not we're going to use Cadillac equation or Darcy's equation. If the water level goes above land surface, Cadillac equation kicks on and that's how it um, it operates and it allows us to simulate that overland flow capability. 
Yes. So when you do the switch, you do the switch during the iteration or during the daily on a daily basis? It does it in the iteration. So that's, you know, we've used the wetland package for years successfully, modeling wetlands. We've used it for modeling reservoir systems, uh, impoundments, and everything like that. So we felt very comfortable that this would have the capability of modeling everything that we kind of needed to with the Everglades and, you know, the STAs and, and water conservation areas. The next set of packages that the district has are specialized routing packages. We have two, the diversion package, which is abbreviated as MDIV, and then we have the RDF package, which is the reinjection drain flow. They both kind of operate the same, but there's a little bit of a difference. The diversion package uses source and sink cells to move water from one location to another. The key is it allows us to set that head, uh, the head upstream and downstream. So if you look at the diagram, basically what happens is in the source cell, the water level has to be above whatever head I set it at, right? And then to move the water over to the sink, in that sink cell, the water level has to be below. So that, that requirement has to be met in order for me to move that water over. And I set the flow rate, I can um, actually manipulate it daily. So every day if I want, um, you know, in the wet season, I can only send X number of quantity of water, I can manipulate it on a daily basis, which is really useful in modeling flood protection areas and then flow rates when they change in the wet and dry season. The other nice thing about the diversion package is that it's multi-diversion. It's not a one-to-one. -one. The source and sink doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. It's one-to-many. So I can pull it from a source and put it in several locations. The other nice thing about the diversion package is when we bring in the ET recharge program and it calculates the runoff, I'm able to use an external source and internal sink into the model. So I can calculate runoff in a basin and input that runoff into the Modflow system. And then Modflow will kick on and move that runoff. So the diversion package has been very successful for us um, when we've been routing kind of runoff and things like that in, um, in our previous models. The RDF package is very similar to the DRT package, um, which you might be familiar with. It uses source and sink cells to move water from one location again to another, but it is one-to-one. -one. And it allows us to change the stage constraints on a daily basis. So the diversion, I can change the flow on a daily basis. The RDF, I change the stage on a daily basis, which is great if I have an operational schedule. Sometimes in, um, Water control districts, for example, in the wet season, they may have a specific stage. They want to keep their canals lower. And in the dry season, they want to keep their canals higher. So modeling those water control districts with the RDF package allows me to control it and change the stage on a daily basis. Um, and we currently implement the RDF package to move water between the, S the stormwater treatment areas, the water conservation areas, and Everglades National Park, which is very useful. And uh, yes. Yeah, for the two packages, I'm going to check the water balance, how much water available can I move? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, what we do is um, so sometimes it's an iterative process. We, um, for example, when we're modeling a specific feature, we need to make sure that water is available before we kind of say this is the quantity of water that we can move over. So, we do that kind of check as an iterative. Calculate how much, for example, runoff is available. So you stop the model, or you do it, or you, you. Yeah. So there's times that we'll run it one time, calculate everything, and then go back, change the the actual quantities, and then do things. Yeah. So that all has to be specified up front. Basically. It's all specified up front. Yep. Yeah, it's input. So well, the nice thing, so with the diversions, for example, we specify the maximum amount of flow that can go, right? But let's say I have 20 cells in that diversion for that particular flow rate. If only 15 of the cells meet the head and uh, the upstream and downstream, the source and sink like head um, levels, only if I'm not gonna send the full quantity of water. It's gonna, it'll divvy up the amount of water that goes to each cell and sum up so it'll be a reduced quantity. 
So you'll notice that that happens as well. And then with data management packages. So one of the things we talked about is how big these files get for a 12,000 stress period model. So we have two packages that we use. One is for post-processing, one is kind of a, um, is a tool used for mod flow input or CBOT input. Um, the multi bud package is post-processing. It creates water budgets for us. Typically, you know, a lot of people look at the whole model's water budget. multi bud allows us to specify specific areas. So if we're interested in just the water conservation areas, I specify those cells, and I can see exactly what's coming in, what's going out, and everything like that. Um, it's used especially during structure flow calibration because I can set the contributing area to that structure, and multi bud will generate the water budget for that area. Um, the other great thing about this is it allows for me to calculate a water budget without needing a cell by cell flow file. It does all of it. Um, it, it maintains everything in on the fly and it keeps us from, I think the cell by cell flow file was, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was terabyte. almost a half a terabyte. So when we're, you know, in the middle of calibration, when we're doing multiple model runs, it, the file size becomes um, a nightmare. Utility generation, the UGen package. That is a district specialized package, which is used to generate time dependent model input. So for example, in the river package, typically you would have the river stage over and over and over again for each stress period because it changes. What UGen allows us to do is we just tell it one time in the river package where the river cells are. And in there we'll say, okay, the stage is governed by this name. And that name will be there in the UGen package. And we can put in, in an Excel file, which makes it very convenient, um, we'll be able to put in the time dependent, like the time series. So it allows us to basically link the static input parameters, such as location, to the temporal um, time series data. And it, increase, it cre increases our efficiency because we only have to read those locations once. Um, and so, again, it significantly reduces file size. And the benefit of this is, when we know we go in and we were like, oh my goodness, we put the wrong um, river stages in or something. We're now looking at an Excel spreadsheet to fix everything. It's much more manageable for us than it is to use like the river package and go in and correct everything. So those are some of the packages um, that we use at the district that we wanted to have the capability of using with this new CWAT code. And now I will um, hand it over to Stacy Coots to talk about the hydro strategy. I just have a quick question sure. before we transition. So, are you doing all this in sort in some kind of GUI, or you're doing it uh, hard coding? So it's yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, they're actually mod flow packages, so they're actually implemented in the original mod flow code. We coded that converted to seawater as well. Okay. So you identify in the name file specific. Like, like the white lab package is not in the white is also put in as a, a regular package. So you, you can see it uh, with like a base test? Um, it doesn't. Not in this size. Yeah, um, this just doesn't handle it specifically. Uh, you can oh, you can review the post product or the alpha files. Mm -hmm. You can modify the info files. It hasn't been uh, added in by the uh, Rumba, I guess. Mm -hmm. They had to add that kit, but mm -hmm. it's not in there yet. Before Stacy starts, I, I want to follow up on Dr. Grant's question. And I think between Anushi and Kevin, you might have the answer. You had a, a good answer for not include, including the lower west coast in our model domain, just because there's there are multiple aquifers over there. But I feel like there's more here in terms of file size that we didn't quite get to, and the fact that now it's not it's not just flow and levels, now it's okay. transport. Can you I I can't speak to it specifically, but can you talk about one of the re another one of the reasons we limited the model domain is because of the, the file size that we're having to deal with here? I think that's part of the answer. I, yeah, uh, just ETN recharge alone, massive files, and originally set up as ASCII files, they were even more large. <laughs> you know, a couple terabytes, I think, was the uh, general size for ETN recharge. Uh, we scaled that way back by creating binary uh, input files. And when you're talking about 
11,688 stress periods <laughs> and for, what is it, 1,060 cells by 300 and some, it's pretty big. <laughs> and then five, five layers? Five layers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you added, essentially you'd have to double that in order to put mm -hmm. it on the West Coast. And you may even have to increase the number of layers because of the West Coast oh, yeah. would probably take at least seven layers, maybe more. And it may not even handle that well if we're uh, getting into the CWA uh, and density dependency and stuff. So you're talking about really adding things up quickly, maybe more possible with like a USG type of thing, or in uh, several years down the road, they go to much more six. Yeah, it kind of raises a larger question too. And you know, I don't think it's so relevant for this particular work right now, but what about the really long term? We want to be able to run these models faster and bigger. And so, you know, parallelization and so forth. Uh, is anybody thinking about that now? Um, I've, I've looked into a few things with it. Uh, I haven't dug into the, the code enough to figure out, oh, is it even practical to try and get a parallelization of some of these processes? With the older uh, mod flow, uh, half of it's not even uh, mod flow <laughs> 90 or anything. So, um, with the newer uh, mod flow six, is probably practical. Um, just haven't, haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting the hydrostratigraphy um, that was processed by Jeff Giddings. Uh, David Butler and myself. Um, we got data from 702 wells across the model domain. I don't have there with the well. Um, and we tried to leverage all the data sources that we had our own database, DB Hydro, and any reports we could get our hands on, consult reports, USGS, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, once we got all that data, we went from the pile of it to identify our hydrostratigraphy, our model layering, and the aquifer parameters. Um, so the hydrostatistically that we ended up using, we're basing it on the Q layers, Q standing for quaternary, um, described by Perkins in 1977, and the Tamiami formation. Um, those Q layers, they correspond to um, static sea level changes during the Pleistocene. Um, and during those sea level changes, um, when you've got the subaerial exposures, um, you end up with these thin layers of lower vertical hydraulic conductivity. So since the geology itself is kind of keeping the water in layers, then we decided that would be a good route to um, base the model layers on. Yes. Sorry, I missed. Uh, what's what are the two layers? Uh, quaternary. Um, oh, quaternary. Oh, yes, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Um, So the Q layers, they're number Q1 to Q5, Q1 being the oldest and the deepest. Um, and as the sea levels change, you can see it then in the lithology with. Um, when the ocean recedes and you've got the plants coming in um, and, and the land is exposed, we've got we've cast some plant remains, um, freshwater limestone is deposited, um, caliche and laminated crusts can be seen, um, and then we can also uh, have uh, solution surfaces and soil and soil freshness. And then conversely, when the sea level rises, um, we can find the rapid growth of coral reefs, sandbars, other marine deposits, and uh, marine fossils. So here's a diagram with our model layers. So you can see how they relate to um, all the different categories that we talked about. We've got our age here in the first column. No, no, no. <laughs> um, our model layers here, one through five, one being the shallowest and five being the deepest. Um, our Q layers, since they're there with the Pleistocene, uh, we're going to use Q1 through Q5 there for layers one through three, and then for layers four and five, we're using the Tamiami formation. Um, we've got in our next column, the stratigraphy. Um, one thing I do want to point out with the stratigraphy is we've got the Fort Thompson formation, the Key Largo limestone, and the Anastasia formation. Um, it looks like they're one on top of the other. They actually got deposited at the same time, but in different geographic regions. So it's kind of them all together in one block. Um, and because of the several Q layers, they kind of overlap one, two, and three. Um, We've got the lithology with that stratigraphy. And then for the hydrostratigraphy, you'll see it uh, doesn't look too clean cut. That's because you can have one layer throughout the model domain in one area, it'll be a little bit more confining. 
and then in other area be like this gate aquifer and, and have a lot of flow. And and just to clarify, during the Quaternary or the last seven hundred fifty thousand years or so, there's five main high sea level stands. So yeah. these relate to each of those high marine depositional events. Um, so here's a geologic map of South Florida, um, just that I can um, point out to you. So we've got the purple along the coast. That's the Anastasia Formation. Um, we have the blue down south for the Miami Limestone, which is there for uh, the layer one. Um, down here with the Keys is uh, in that lime green is uh, Key Largo Limestone. And the green there in the middle, um, that's the Shelly sediments of Bioplicism age that encompasses both the Caloosahatchee and the Port Toxic Formation there in, in, this, in the middle. Um, and then also because I'm throwing out lithology words, sometimes it helps to have a picture to it so you can actually um, have an idea for uh, what all the geo geologic lingo means. Um, so we've got the Miami limestone over here, uh, which is part of our model layer one. Um, and you can see it's very porous. Um, this is actually for the um, lytic species of Miami limestone. I've got a picture there of the woods, which are just like these granules of carbonate. Um, they get to be about like two millimeters in size. Um, here's the Port Thompson formation, um, so that shelly limestone, um, and that's going to be split up across model layers one, two, and three. Um, we've got Key Largo limestone next. Um, this photo was taken at uh, Windley Key Geological State Park. Um, so you can see the large coral there as part of it. Um, in the top right is the Caloosahatchee Formation. Um, that's going to be part of model layers two and three. Um, it's the silty Shelley mythology. And then in the bottom right, um, if you've ever been to the beach over here off of our coast, you've probably seen it, the Anastasia Formation. Um, this is the Coquina. Um, so it's just a lot of little shell fragments. That have been cemented together. And that's there for um, part of model layers one through three. Um, so for the fuller breakdown of uh, layer one, um, the lithology included in this is our Holocene sediments, the late flirt marl, and undifferentiated soil and sand. And we're going to use the top two Q layers, Q5 and Q4. We've got the chemical sand, which is a quartz sand. And the Miami limestone, which I showed the picture of the analytic species for it. Um, and then we're going to take the top portions of the Port Thompson formation, Key Largo limestone, and the Anastasia formation here as part of layer one. Uh, for layer two, this is going to be Q2 and Q3, uh, will be the middle portion of the Port Thompson formation, the Key Largo limestone, and the Anastasia formation, and then the top portion of the Caloosahatchee. And then we've got layer three, which is our final key layer. Um, that'll be that bottom portion of the Port Thompson Formation, the Key Largo Limestone, and the Anastasia Formation. And then that bottom portion, that last Q layer of the Caloosahatchee Formation. Um, layer four, um, since four and five are defined by the Tamiami Formation, we're using the Pine Crest Sand Number of the Tamiami Formation. Layer four, which is a quartz sand, it's very bivalve rich. You can see the bivalve fragments in the photo there. Um, quartz sandstone, sandy limestone, some shell mud, mudstone, and, and phosphate grains. And then for uh, layer five, which is the Achoki number of the Tamiami formation, um, it's locally known as the gray limestone aquifer um, from the west coast, and elsewhere, it's uh, also known as the lower Tamiami aquifer. And you can see how it got its name, the gray limestone. It's very gray limestone. <laughs> um, a lot of bivalves in it, uh, with some sandstone and uh, molded quartz sandstone. Uh, so here are the uh, maps of the elevations and thicknesses. So I'll go through these. Um, so for layer one, we have an elevation from zero to 75 feet in GVD. And our thickness ranges from seven to 120 feet. Um, so uh, the seven feet here along the western boundary, um, that actually had to be artificially put in because it's pinching out. So in order to have um, uh, model stability, um, 
the things up there at some point. So for our layer two, um, we have an elevation range of 40 to negative 110 feet in GBD. Um, with it getting like deeper as you get closer to the coast. Um, and our thickness ranges from 10 to 110 feet. For layer three, the top elevation ranges from 15 to 160 feet in GBD. Um, and the thickness ranges from 9 to 50 feet. For layer 4, um, it ranges from 0 to negative 200 feet in GBD, and the thickness ranges from 10 to 120 feet. Back. Finally, layer 5, uh, the elevation ranges from negative 50 to negative 380 feet. And the thickness uh, ranges from uh, nine to 210 feet. Could you go back to one for a bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, just because I'm curious, I mean, in terms of like uh, you know, the thickening of the overall of this game, the really permeable stuff, is that kind of shown here pretty well, I guess? Uh, I guess so, right? It's sort of wedge shaped quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting thicker as you get closer yeah. to the coast. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you can see it here as well, mm -hmm. getting as you get to the coast. Um, this one, overall, fairly thin layer. Um, then, so our bottom, yes. for layer five, our bottom elevation um, goes from negative 50 to negative 380 feet in GBD. Um, so uh, here's two maps that um, are all five of those layers put together um, in a composite. On the left, we've got our hydraulic conductivity in feet per day, and the right, transmissivity in feet squared per day. Uh, and this is really just to highlight how, like, spatially um, it, the, the permeability of the superficial aquifer changes. You've got this gain aquifer down south, um, it's very high. And where do you get these from? From the model. Yeah. What do you mean? So we, well, we, did, we took, we basically took all the, the APT data. Um, we figured out the hydraulic conductivities based on um, the APTs came from DB Hydro. DB Hydro. We pulled all of the reports that we could find, um, USGS reports. We had consultants who had gone out to various areas and done, you know, test holes and um, things like that. We pulled basically everything. I think it's a total of 702, but we keep adding. If we find additional information, yeah. we add it in, recreate, and update everything. All right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I kind of have looked a lot of those old fish and steward reports, basically, but you know, the majority of the tests in there were inconclusive in the sense that the, the actual values were higher with, than what they were reporting as a maximum or a minimum, basically. So I don't know if that figures in here. I'm not sure what's in DB Hydro in terms of all those uh, aquifer performance tests, but it's interesting. You know, it's something I've been interested in for a long time, what the limits of this is and how sometimes it may not even really behave like a normal uh, Darcy in forest medium. I know for this purpose, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you should you think you touched on it. Whatever APT values that we have, and we gave greater weight to those that were actual full blown, sometimes multi day aquifer tests. Mm -hmm. uh, there is other information there, like uh, K values and T values derived from specific capacity tests and slope tests, and those are given given lower weights when we go mm -hmm. through the creation process. Okay. So it's really focused more on the aquifer, the the you know classical aquifer test information is given greater weight compared to some of those other tests, which are probably good more for order of magnitude type of, of calculations. Right. And and but your comment about some of the the tests that are included in Fish and Stewart and stuff like that is, is well founded. And and you know we we struggle a little bit with that as you know they report the value, you know, it's definitely not Darcy and flow. What are we supposed to do? You no, know, mm -hmm. I think we wound up using the value that was in the report, but we recognize that there could be examples where, you know, it's so permeable that you know we really can't capture that. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
I think that will probably, in the back of our minds as we go through the calibration process, um, you know, that fact is in the back of our minds when we go through that to understand that, A, you know, this is super, super transmissive here. You know, we'll, we need to take that into account when, when we get there. And we kind of, as we're calibrating, we pay attention to how much kind of leeway we have mm -hmm. um, or wiggle room for the hydraulic conductivities when we know, okay, this is so porous or if we if we're comfortable we'll look at the data or the reports and we'll say okay were they penetrating you know, multiple layers how do we assign those different we consider all of those things when we're when we're calibrating and, and looking at how to assign the values mm -hmm. so these are calibrated values based on the APT. Yeah, yeah. Or just no, APT. they're not calibrated yeah. just okay. APT. Okay. Just APT. It, it's apt values that were creaged yes. so okay. that we get a smooth yeah. surface okay. and also th these are composite of yeah, yeah. all yeah, of the layers that. You know, the reality is how the model works is it doesn't look at composite. It's looking at the, the individual properties of individual layers as we go through. Yeah, this is all five layers. Yeah, yeah. this is a, it's, it's a, hopefully a convenient way to demonstrate to you all that we have information and, and obviously that the permeability increases rather dramatically as we move from north to south and, and you know, substantially. <laughs> And also the, the shape, the blue shape you see on the left side, that shape is very similar to what you see in, I believe it's the fish report. I'm not sure if it's- Oh yeah, it's still no, it. it looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then now we're taking those hydraulic properties, splitting up by layer, we've got hydraulic conductivity of layer one. Uh, and this ranges from five to 20,000 uh, feet per day. The highest in the south. Um, our hydraulic conductivity of layer two ranges from five to seventy-five thousand feet per day, and the highest in the south. And for layer three, um, same where it ranges from five to seventy-five thousand feet per day. And for layer four, ranges from five to ten thousand feet per day. And for layer five, uh, ranges from five to 6,000. Can you project what date in time we'll move to a metric system? Try that in the 70s. I don't know. What a shame we missed an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, it's like forever. I think it's driven by the South Florida Water Management Model, which is in the, I mean, or could you just yeah. say today? Our model will be mentioned. <laughs> everything we have is in English. Yeah. Everything. So I, I don't know. I mean, I know we're, we're going to uh, NABD. NABD. Uh -huh. the, uh, yeah. Even that's been slower than we would have liked. But yeah. Uh, I'm going to pass it over now to the heat for the salt water something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my staff are sick to hear me say it, but I'm going to share it with you. The panel is uh, I, I quote from General Eisenhower that I use often is plans are worthless, and but planning is everything. And really, this kind of gets back to back even in, in the 2000s, we were talking about the need for density dependent modeling on this regional scale. And we understood that, you know, there's, you know, individual wells that we'll, we'll have a good time series for, but we also wanted to look at something uh, in plan view. And that's where this uh, mapping exercise come in, comes in. So in 2009, it was the first time we did um, saltwater interface mapping in the water management district. Um, our plan was to develop these maps every five years, take a look at them, Note areas of concern, uh, adjust monitoring, and uh, we've, you know, because of development, we lose wells all the time. You know, uh, back in, uh, you know, 30 years ago, we would put wells in on the side of a road, and now those roads have expanded, and we had a great 30-year data point, and now because the road's been expanded, it's gone, and we had to get, thankfully, sometimes we find money to replace those wells, but our, um, I refer to it as the sole or intrusion monitoring network, but it's really not a network in the sense that it's a formalized thing. We, we leverage whatever saltwater intrusion monitoring well information that we can get from any source. And that's how we generate these maps. 
So we use all the information from the USGS, our own wells, information from counties, and most importantly, uh, water use permittees. That's where we get the information to generate these maps. We've been mapping the furthest inland extent of the interface at the conclusion of the dry season, uh, just to try to get a worst case example of what happened in that particular year. We used the 250 milligram per liter chloride values for the isopor. I think the USGS uses a thousand. When you on a, on a map of certain size, I don't know that sometimes it's the the thickness of the of the width of the pen that you can tell the difference between those two. And we do it for all the coastal aquifers, with the exception of Miami Dade County, because they have a contract with uh, the USGS to do that for them. In the in the past. Um, Individual counties have contracted with the GS to develop these maps, but it was very um, catch as catch can. I think there was one for Broward County in 1990. I think there was one for Palm Beach County in, in 1988. Um, it just wasn't done very regularly. So again, back in the 2000s, knowing what we were seeing back then in terms of sea level rise and climate change and things like that, we started realizing that we needed to do something in terms of better mapping and monitoring of that to eventually allow us to, to get to the point that we're at now, which is to have something that we can, you know, calibrate a model to. So that, that was really the genesis of, the, of this mapping effort. Uh, this is a, a summary of what the data looks like. We have a map ID, facility ID, the name, the well name, our X and Y coordinates, and case depth and total depth and chloride value. Now, the, I mentioned all those data sources, and I mentioned this earlier, some of them are in specific conductance, some of them are in chloride, some of them are in TDS. In this case, we were uh, translating everything back to chlorides for uh, solar interface mapping, but there's, um, this is good stuff. This was data that was scrubbed. I will tell you that uh, there's other data that's in, the, in those databases, which is not very reliable, and that wasn't used, and that's been excluded. So what we've used is high quality stuff that we feel confident really represents, you know, the chloride value at that particular site. So this is an example of what the interface map looks like, uh, in particular in Briar County. We have three different uh, isoflores on this map. We have a 2009, 2014, and 2019. And the reason I wanted to point this out is because in some of the other coastal aquifers uh, throughout the district, the interface position is relatively stable. Um, there, are, there are instances where in um, some places it's actually retreated a little bit. I think uh, Lake Worth was an example of one in the 2014 map where the interface retreated from the 2009 version. It was because they switched a, a, a large majority of their demands from the surficial to the Florida aquifer. And you can literally see that in when you five years later when you're doing the mapping that the interface had retreated toward the coast, which is, which is a good thing. But um, the reason I'm highlighting Broward here is I, I think this is one of the, I, probably Miami Day too, but at least for the mapping that we did, this is one of the few places where in five-year increments, you can see the movement of the interface. And I think in, in Matthew, that's going to be very helpful to us in terms of, of calibration. It's not only seeing the data on a you know, time series on an individual well basis, but looking at it in plan view over this entire area. And, and hopefully we'll be able to, when we get to that point during calibration, that these would be uh, good maps to take a look at to try to see if we can actually get the model to have the interface move. Because sometimes in some previous modeling efforts, sometimes it can be kind of stubborn. It doesn't want to move very much. So if we can get the model to actually come close to this type of um, movement over five-year increments, I think we're going to be uh, you know, very well off because of it. And, and again, this is an example of, uh, I'm not sure exactly where this is, but um, here's the, you can see in red is the 2019 interface, and you can see these black lines on either side of it. So what we tried to do is pick wells that are on either side of the interface. So here's one, for example, G2693, I think it's in Broward, where the water quality has been relatively stable over the 20-something year um, period of record, and the chloride values are less than 50. And then we have a well, G2478, where uh, it was very stable for 10, 15 years. We started seeing some movement. And in this case, you can literally see the interface pass through the screen interval of this well. And I, again, this is another example of uh, whether it's plan view, and now this is more uh, time series on individual wells, and this is what we're trying to replicate during the calibration process. So, 
Okay, so it is what time now? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. How long of a break would you like to have, Lisa? Um, 15 minutes. 10 15? Minutes. Are we doing okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll take a 15 minute break and see you back here at 10.
We'll look at that later. Okay. 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 Uh, Great. Um, my name is Kevin Rodberg, and I've done most of the work on the CWAT enhancements that we're calling CWAT 2022. Um, I've worked with Modflow since 1984, way back when we called it Big Mac when I was young, yeah, uh, from McDonald Harbor uh, days. Um, so I have had quite a long history working with it, typically just adding bug fixes, um, adding in packages here and there. Uh, worked with Modflow 88, uh, 96, 2000, 2005, not only just generally reviewed Modflow 6. Um, the trade in my slide looking going here. Do I go to a point two? Alicia, did you click in the presentation? Go ahead and that. Oh, okay, here we go. So, uh, uh, see what background or how it's related to Modflow. Uh, essentially, uh, see what 2000 is a coupled version of Modflow 2000 and MT3D MS. Uh, is published by the USGS and it's designed to simulate three dimensional and variable density groundwater flow, multi species transport. Uh, See what's generally divided into three processes, as I basically term, term them throughout this presentation, focusing on groundwater flow, variable density flow, and integrated mass transport, plus the linked mass transport aspect that where you transfer data back and forth with mod flow and the MT3D. Uh, variable density flow process is mod flow uh, based packages. It's based on mod flow based packages. So there's groundwater flow version subroutines and variable density subroutines. Variable density flow um, uses mod flow and MT3 methodologies to solve um, the variable density groundwater flow. As I said, variable density versions of the groundwater flow uh, packages. Integrated mass transport uh, process uh, provides um, actual solute transport equations. And again, what I briefly mentioned linked mass transport LMT is a coupling of the, uh, the two separate models. I added some footnotes here to basically identify the versions of code and things like that, that we uh, started with in our process. Uh, so to meet the objectives of the ECSM and new mod flow and see what features were needed. Which involved combining the groundwater flow product to be reported in what we're calling see what 2000 WMD, which is added on packages. Um, with see what's variable density flow and the integrated mass transport processes. The original WMD packages um, were enhancements to mod flow 96, so way back. 1998, I think, is when uh, Mr. Fulman uh, et al. added these things, <coughs> um, or most of them. Uh, they were also added later on into C1 2000, uh, but they were all developed as groundwater flow packages. They didn't support variable density or uh, so. Specifically, for this project, we're uh, interested in the wetlands, the reinjected rate <laughs> flow, uh, UGEN, and most of the burdens. Um, the future or the features needed for ECSM uh, were primarily the focus of the uh, 2022 uh, code enhancements or development. Um, the ECSM required variable density, value transport as I mentioned before. So these packages required CBO C enhancements, RDF, MDIV, and a new layer property flow wetlands. Um, I think I initially mentioned earlier. It was a block center flow and prop in the past layer property um, flow provides a more robust approach vertical conductance um, than the BCSB kind of approach. So there's also an issue, I think, with viscosity and CWAP uh, only supports LPF. Realistically, we probably could have modified it to uh, BCF, but um, it's just a nice benefit there. Um, additional focus of the 2022 development uh, were enhancements to the transport packages. Um, properly simulate open water conditions in wetlands 
and then required adjustments to the porosity, diffusion, and specificity equations uh, to account for a portion of water in layer one that's above the mat surface of the saturated area. Uh, also, due to ECSM's large domain, some specialized subroutines or modifications were needed to facilitate reading uh, binary and ET recharge, um, which greatly reduces file size, speeds up processing, and uh, at the same time. Um, we also do saving of concentrations as monthly uh, rather than um, uh, daily, and those are also savings, binary data. Uh, it's interesting that transport package is allowed for that, but the root bug in there, so I had to change some order. <laughs> so it's really simple fix to do. Um, we also have some a little more efficient management of transport sources and sinks uh, that allows implementation of some of these things without using the source and sink mixing, which can drastically reduce things, especially when we have millions of source and sink cells throughout the model. Uh, at least millions, probably not quite that. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands. Um, this is kind of an interesting slide because uh, it actually lays out the entire um, the entire process and it focuses on the additive approach. We uh, started off with CWAT 2000 WMB up here in the upper left hand corner. And in the first phase of this project called phase zero, we added on, um, I say added on there. In, in this particular case, we actually made sure that the code that was used um, for the water management packages in C1 2000 was consistent with the best available USGS um, C1, which was actually released in 2012. So it's 2008 version 4.01, I think it is, and includes bug fixes through 2012 from Chris Andrew, I think, or most of them published. So we call that C1 2012 WMD, just as a starting point. Um, from that, First phase, the project was developing an LPF wetlands package, um, essentially based on the LPF um, flow, um, taking into account how the equations were used in PCF. And we had that bit of LPF. That becomes CY 2020 WMD because it was done in 2020. <laughs> so, uh, phase two generally outlined. Uh, we had to add a variable density uh, flow for wetlands. And I broke that out special because it was um, more of something new than uh, the BDF WMD packages were fairly straightforward, um, but also um, added to the overall capability to do an, uh, an essentially an uncoupled uh, C button on the work. So we call that C button 2020 variable density flow. We added on transport and the next step for wetlands. And that was just focused just on transport wetlands. See what 2020 and T3D. Uh, and finally, phase four was transport um, for the wetland or the west of the water management district packages or those extra add ons um, for setup, also handled transport. And the extra thing was open water transport. There is a portion of water above saturated or land surface in the wetland areas uh, and accounting for the faster movement of flow, the porosity of the diffusion and dispersion equations had to be altered somewhat throughout the transport. So um, to get that transform capability or movement of the water quality better. Um, so, and that comes down to where we are today with CBOT 2022. Find the bus. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, you know, normally when we put in some kind of new process or some new thing we want to simulate, there's a lot of testing against some kind of analytical solution or something like that. Do you have you documented all that for this work? And yes, um, most uh, well, each of these phases of the code uh, involve testing versus other other simulations and models. Um, Expected our results, uh, we get comparisons of heads for some concentrations and things like that. And we show a couple of examples of these types of things, but essentially, each step of the process was very thoroughly tested. Uh, 
going through it. Like I said, incremental or phased approach to make sure oh, I didn't break everything in front. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess it's even an opportunity to publish uh, potentially uh, oh, yeah. on these things if you can. Yeah. You're going to see the comparison. Okay. Uh, the final version of CWAP 2022, we did a, a comparison with the, the test cases that are in the original CWAP documentation, yeah. and then also compared it at various times to we had some existing mod flow based models. We ran this code with that, and you'll see in the presentation that we were able to replicate this. Okay. Yeah, I had several questions. Number one, so the BDF. It's very straightforward, I can imagine, right? So do you think anything on the VDF part? I'm sorry, say it again. Do you think anything on the VDF part of the, the package? Um, the, the actual variable density is mainly just an add-on. It's like we have a, an RDF package that needs to support variable density. So we have to create the subroutines that are associated with it. Um, but they were uh, modeled or used a template of other existing um modflow packages that support media um the bdf wetlands is very similar to lpf variable density so it's like taking into account new uh, wetland out um, equations built into that code so we take the variable density lpf and say oh what do we add on that and i'll get into a few of those things in a couple of slides okay and the second question is you might also discuss it yeah do you think of variable viscosity in this model? Um, this viscosity is um, it's still part of the VDF's um, uh, process or yeah, VDF process. The VDF LPF the layer property flow uh -huh. um, implementation is in LPF. So I actually translated that into the LPF wetlands as well. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's Go right into it. So then time share is a variable. You you have a time share as input yeah. to the model as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh last one is uh, all of the modification have you done in Fortran or yes. in, in other codes? Uh yeah, all the all the code we've done in Fortran is it very closely matches the existing code uh -huh. and structure and style. There were a few cases where I modified the BCF code itself more closely resembled as the or style of the LPF code, um, getting rid of some of the go-tos and uh, the let and do, let and do statements, we use some exits and cycles and stuff that cleaned up the code just a little bit. Actually, some things actually made it faster. Okay. Uh, so oh, that's that nice. kind of a benefit. And cleaning up, it, some of it looked kind of spaghetti. Oh, you know, so creating these, um, it was a couple of challenges, some of these, and, very uh, intricate do loop combinations and go tos were, were a little tricky, but making sure that they worked appropriately with all the different test cases was, was ideal and making sure that nothing broke <laughs> you know, in the process. And so, I mean, that's yeah. great because you know, you have yes, my approach was solving the as a sovereign C C plus plus plus. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't create a lot of problems that people <laughs> don't want to compile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well. okay, thanks. How closely thanks. do you work with USGS on this? I mean, I, I actually I did not work with anyone at the USGS. It's like I relied entirely on papers that already existed. And realistically, the, the code um, changes were very simple to follow as far as, okay, we have a BCF wetland package. And like I said, I'll get into some of it. It's like, oh, okay, what's the difference between BCF wetlands and BCF? But, oh, well, this code has to be put into LPF. So you add that on to that. Now, what's the difference between LPF and variable density? LPF. So, oh, okay, I can see those differences. Now, those same types of differences have to be applied in the LPF buttons to make a variable in the LPF button. The same strategy goes through the entire process. The biggest or most, um, something that probably wasn't following a template type of thing was the addition of the porosity and what I call layer zero um, in the IMT process. So that's basically touching quite a few of the subroutines in the MP3D portions of couple. And some of these things we'll touch on more, but yeah. And we'll get down to the bottom line here. One of the advantages it now has is we have sea level rising drastically 
in southern Everglades National Park and, and, and south of Miami-Dade County. Sea level, I mean, the ground surface is barely above sea level. So now we believe we have the capability to actually see what happens to the when the ocean comes in in the south part of the district. And it allows uh, even the vertical, you know, open, you know, that type of interaction is also going to be very helpful. Um, one thing we hadn't implemented yet is we just we account for the open water in the LPF wetland areas within the wetland boundary, um, which could be modified. We could say, oh, any of the LPF layer one, think we can allow for open water uh, transport. Um, and in that particular case, it wouldn't be using the catalytic equation for the flow, but it would allow for um, the movement and the dispersivity and dispersion. Um, Counting for by capacity practically one, you know, in that open water area, plus layer one, and areas where the tide may have came up that aren't considered wetlands right now. But we haven't implemented that, hasn't seemed to be necessary yet, but we'll see. So, yeah, I just want to follow up on the chair's uh, uh, comment. So, you OW means the open water. So, mm -hmm. one in Twitter, you put salt water over the land using a private. Yeah. So, you have a model stable because you have a very unstable situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it, uh, I haven't seen any instability um, when we've been doing stuff, but we haven't, we haven't raised the water level. Uh, significant, we haven't raised it a foot or anything like that. And no, I mean, you, you got seawater flooding the um, uh, uh, fresh water, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we haven't we haven't seen so we far the heavy density of water on top, yes. Yeah, okay, so and that's what we call the instable well, condition, right? Oh, um, I'm not sure. We've actually simulated something similar to that at Turkey Point. Uh, oh, you know, okay. Turkey Point system has a super high per se, I mean, cooling canal system, and we've simulated that super dense water moving down and spreading out. Oh, yeah, that's that's the yeah. Okay. Yeah, like the models work, and you know that too. Yeah. But it's in terms of like how many fingers they predict and all this stuff, you know, that's the yeah. challenging part that nobody's really sure about. Is uh, like with the tsunamis and stuff going over the land. So this will be an issue here, but you know, it's gonna be just kept being able to do it, bringing the salt water over the land is gonna be really a positive step forward right. and a really important. So. And you can also, in some of the later slides, you can actually see where the fresh water actually pushes back on the, the salt water mm -hmm. in case of always, uh, maybe we didn't have all of the, the initial water quality uh, set is actually in actual conditions. They're based on pre-condition. We'll get some of these slides. Kind of interesting to look at. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about the, the Miami-Dade urban model too, and the way they do it. Like they have uh, daily time steps, and then they kind of like they change the boundary conditions from like drains to general head boundaries depending on how high the water is compared to the land. You know, so it's very complicated, but. In a sense, you have to do something like this, I guess, to determine where the wetland extent is to, or I don't know how it works. The extent starts off with the wetland boundary that actually defines that, but yeah. um, the equations for when you use Cadillac and Darcy's actually changes based on the difference in the head surface um, versus the monk surface yeah. kind of thing. So that could come in from the ocean boundaries. Like, I don't know, it's on a daily time steps, you'll see uh, the seasonal king tide season, basically. And so, and then with some years of sea level rise on top of that, eventually it will come over some areas. This is the idea. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, some of these tidal things are probably more significant than the shorter uh, stress period or time steps yeah. uh, than what we're using right now is daily. So yeah. We're using the daily now. And yeah. We were right. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's like the overview slide. We've got a lot. Of, <laughs> we've got a lot of detail on every one of these steps, so it might be good to <laughs> roll through that. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 uh, essentially, day, day zero is where it merged the code, and one of the um, the key things was it's being consistent with the CWAC code. Uh, they were slightly. Uh, out of sync with the version, so it's like getting some bug fixes and that type of thing. 
place would, would be key. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we I set up Visual Studio projects for these things using um, debug and release uh, properties and stuff. So we're using existing uh, projects all the way through this stuff. So we can even compare one version to the next <laughs> and get expected results. Um, phase one was uh, added on to the 2012 WMD. So it provides the groundwater flow version of the well inspection. Basically, that was it in a nutshell. But something that we hadn't had before and was a good starting point for this whole project. Um, the comparison of BCF and LPS source code, as I mentioned before, actually allowed us to identify what code or logic needed to be transferred from the BCF wetlands to a new LPS wetlands code. Um, and just to not to repeat, you don't need to read it. Uh, in general, the idea is there's six primary subroutines that support uh, LPF wetlands, and they're essentially the same six that uh, address LPF in general for groundwater flow. Um, this goes into some of the details about what uh, what makes it a little bit different from LPF than what's LPF wetlands. Um, realistically, there's like six, or, I don't know, almost 1,800 lines of code just for LPF uh, and LPF wetlands. So it's a kind of embarrassing to figure out what's what. Um, once the code was all put in, place the a comparison or head difference map comparing BCF versus LPF wetlands. Um, and the main thing to look at or focus on is the areas within these yellow polygons that are within the LPF or the wetland boundary. We expected to see no difference and we got anything we actually got slightly better response in the calibration uh, criteria. So those are virtually identical results for heads within. Uh, well, there are some slight differences outside, and it's completely related to the difference between the layer property flow, um, for conductance versus the V conductance. And you see that. Yeah. Let me let me just add. So the one on the left, we have a, we have an existing oh, yeah. mod flow model, uh, and this this is in the in this is a portion of ECSM model. domain. we have an existing mod flow model. That's what's on the left, and that was. At the wetland package with uh, BCF based, and Kevin is saying we 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 took that model and converted it to LPF, and and our this graphic is showing the the heads in the in the yellow boxes, which are the wetland cells, and and the heads are virtually identical. So the conversion of uh, BCF to LPF on the wetlands was successfully conducted. Is that your yeah, question? exactly. And this is the North Palm Beach area here. Stadium. For reference, it's, we call it LECSR or North Palm or Fox Hatch Um The next phase was the variable density wetlands um, and the WMD packages, the kind of a combination um, project. But as you mentioned before, it's like variable density is pretty straightforward as far as how it has to be implemented. It's just a matter of making sure rigorously going through the code doing the comparisons, identifying what needed to be added to. Need new patch with the RDF, multiple diversion, even some slight tweaks in the UGEN package in order to support some of these things. Um, again, the wetlands packages were also just groundwater flow before and now needed to be migrated to variable density. Uh, so, lots of subroutines to compare. This is basically all this is shown. Uh, the left is just oh, comparing BCF groundwater flow to BCF variable density flow. Center ones, LPF has several more subroutines involved with it in more code. So it's kind of a flow The last one is more focusing on some of the um, WMD packages. Okay, well, what do I have to add to this package uh, in order to make it variable density? It hasn't been done before. So I look at okay, the GHBs do some a certain type of thing that's similar to um, the RDFs or the RDF, I mean, I'm sorry, the RDF and the ERT package um, are very similar. So comparing these things actually helps highlight uh, what differences and things I needed to add. Don't forget this step, you got to, you know, there's this special case all the time. So this is just a 
quick comparison. No sense in you know, trying to read the code, but you can very quickly compare portions of the code that are different. And then I have just the tools in Notepad plus plus compare to go to put them in side by side. What's the differences? I highlighted block. So the brown over here on the right stuff that had to be added to variable density LPF, um, or it was highlighted because it was added um, from the groundwork flow version. So that stuff had to go into the weapons uh, and the new new packages uh, and comments and stuff like that. You can ignore those. But once variable density flow is put together, a quick test of or the expected thing, we would want to see slightly, uh, we'd want to see head differences along the coast, but we have higher density. I, I created an art, call it artificial, just a simplistic uh, higher water quality along the coast and fresher water inland. So within the wetland areas, we wanted to see, oh, no differences there where the impacts of higher water quality along the coast. We wanted to see some impacts, and we did uh, as well. So we also ran uh, the ECFM, the ECFM, it's called Florida model, which was originally based on just a pure seawater code and it's Florida, uh, same general area, um, but compared um, with the old code and the new code, same results. So uh, basically, again, testing and make sure we didn't break anything in the process. Um, the next, getting into the transport. A little more complicated here because I was less familiar with the MT3D, but um, it's also um, this demonstrates uh, how we provide solute transport in the wetland package. The same type of implementation uh, exists in the LPF for transport. So it's just mad a matter of adding in, well, you replicate the same subroutines and then you add in the pieces that are for wetlands. And you make the calls from the see what main uh, were appropriate. Uh, so I don't think. Oh, uh, essentially, there's no change in the actual equations that have to be solved, uh, especially with like the groundwater flow, because it's still the same groundwater flow. It's just changing what's modified in the right hand side and the coefficient. That's very thickness. Um, so, in order to do the code comparisons here, though, we wanted to make sure that um, transport was supported for either variable density or not. Just for completeness sake, this project only required variable density uh, transport, but to make it complete and to make sure that the testing was all done properly, we used constant density flow for LPF, constant density LPF buttons. And that thing, variable density LPF and LPF variable density wells. And then just go full cycle. We said, oh, okay, well, what we created for constant density <laughs> LPF wells, how's that compared to this? Make sure that all the, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And again, type the code and say, in the process of doing the uh, variable density LPF wetlands, we have a whole bunch of Commented code. This oh, this is all wetland stuff. And it's very simple. They oh, uh, stuff with brown or highlighted with green comments. They need to be packed into the LPF. Uh, and let's see. Oh, okay, so once all this was done, now we have transport with uh, wetlands and our um, this. Now this is just wetland transport phase three. So ideally, what you see here. Starts up some initial weapon conditions um, and water quality. And like I said, the initial after month one, year one, year 16, year 32, kind of small text on the bottom. You actually see the progression. And it's kind of nice, or I think it's fairly obvious when I look at the maps, but I'm looking for it. It's like, well, did we see movement of water quality in wetland areas? So these circled areas are. Like in Conservation Area 3 and, and the park, you can actually see the water was getting fresher as we moved through time. And, and what's of, driving that one? What's driving the temporal difference here? Um, it's actually movement of fresh water into the system. Initially, these conditions here were 
uh, slightly higher PDS and they may not have been uh, completely stable yet because they're just kept, we haven't calibrated the initial conditions yet. Um, but as things stabilize over time, uh, did I have another slide? I don't think I had that much. I had, I had one slide um, previously. It actually showed how um, the water quality uh, actually sharpens the pressures up along the edges. You, you can see the fresh getting a get really sharp interface along the coast um, after the models had a chance to stabilize and not creep the data, but it's, it actually moves it to where uh, the actual conditions. Uh, about 7,000 <laughs> stress periods actually allow it to migrate. So no sea level change. Not either. in this. No. So you've just got an initial condition that's being flushed. Exactly. Um, there, there are some stresses in here from pumping conditions, you know, just in the early process of getting calibration up and running. So like I said, I'm, I'm not a ground water modeler. I know how to set up mod flow. I know how to run it. Uh, and I know how the code works inside. So. Um, I'll leave that to the, the models. So, Kevin, this is just basically checking to see that the code is capable of transport changes under the different pumping stresses that you just initially picked as a test. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, and a lot more review was done in very focused areas. It's like you zoom in and say, oh, okay, what's going on in this particular area? You know, you get real focused on some of these things to say, oh, I know what's happening in this particular uh, area, I've got some hydrographs that actually show me what's going on. I expect, say, hydrographs, it's a concentrations over time. Say, okay, is it moving in the general right direction? That, that type of thing. So that was some of the basis for the uh, areas that we saw things that weren't expected to say we address in, I think, the next slide, which is, um, oops, sorry, transport for the WMD packages and adjustments for open water wells. Um, the integration of the water management district packages were done in a similar fashion that the regular transport for wetlands uh, work was done. Uh, the IMT processes for CY needed extra work to support open water wetlands. And that was specifically related to uh, porosity, dispersion, diffusion, uh, that weren't accounted for in that area of water above the saturated thickness and uh, or above the muck. Uh, the, where is it? Oh, I think that's probably it. Oh, the integrated cellular transport processes were also, these were the focus of water management district practice, which is the RDF, MDiv, and UGEN. And we have some pictures of how these corrections and things work. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can go back. So for the open water, you are you going to use a different set of dispersivities for the open water? Uh, somewhat. There, there's a actually a, a new subroutine that I added. It basically accounts for um, there's a a thickness weighted ratio of open water and saturated thickness for layer one. So we call it layer zero in the uh, input file. So this this person. ESP file and the BTN file have two different things. One's for porosity, one has for and diffusion equations or values. So by cranking up porosity closer to one for open water, and that it's weighted, not showing another equation here, it's a really simple equation. It's just based on okay, if you have one for uh, one foot of open water and you have one, two for you know, two feet, <laughs> you know, your average says. Based on the yeah, but the, you know, because MT three D basically the ground, for groundwater soil transport. Yeah. yeah, all the dispersivities, you know, transverse, uh, longitudinal, all the flow to the groundwater. Yeah. So right now you have open water, it's different from groundwater, right? I mean, you know, there's theoretically you have a different uh, they the call it total velocity, right? In the dispersivity calculation. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the word. Tall, tall to city, tall to all city. city. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So if you look at about a theory about how the, the sound pilot is working, and so the particle actually goes through around the salt. Right? Oh, 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 oh. So in open water, you don't have that stuff anymore. Right. So then you do you need a, a new set of new of the dispersion with or not? Well, the, the thing is, is I, I treated even the 
longitudinal dispersion and fusion equations, similar to what I did with the open water. But the idea was is to, um, based on the thickness of open water and the thickness of the saturated, right, every stress period, we would actually calculate how it's every iteration. Uh, we actually go and calculate, okay, what is the updated distribution or dispersion, diffusion, and porosity values for those sets? So every they're updated every time. Yeah, so I think the answer is yes, there are different values of dispersivity in the open water. But it's still a single layer. Sorry, but yeah, it's still treating it as layer one. Yeah, but the what, I'm curious you you input one set of data that from yeah, that one. Yeah. That is for surface water. You if you want to wait it, you still have a new data to to be waiting, right? Right. But, but it, yeah. it, maybe it's, it's oh, it cannot be but, and, but it's right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, first of all, right. all of these yeah. subroutines have uh, have to be touched in some sense to account for if you have a saturated thickness layer. Or layer one, and you need to add open water above it with this adjusted capacity and dispersivity or um, diffusion. Those are all addressed in these red. One extra subroutine here that calculates open water adjusted longitudinal dispersion and diffusion. So, in this, this kind of gives you a little bit of a nutshell on our example. Um, we pass the open water thickness uh, into the code every one of the subroutines that needed and we had the porosity and the dimensions for the porosity change whether they had the weapon package turned on or not so it's kind of just a little trick you know the dimensioning um is whether we use this layer zero or not so in here which if we're in wetland boundary weapon package turned on we're in layer one porosity is recalculated um based on the open water and the open water porosity the DZ, which is the saturated thickness, and then plus porosity times. So basically, the open water equation is just um, it's that ratio weighted open water to saturated thickness in the muck area. Now, when you go to actually use it later on, is all you have to do is use the adjusted porosity now, whereas up oh, down here, and you multiply that by the saturated thickness plus the open water thickness. So for each layer. And those are just again within what the area where they affect. And it seems to work uh, fine. And from everything I've looked at, I don't, I didn't see any areas where we violating <laughs> any of the uh, um, balance or the budgets for the transport. But well, let me make a suggestion. You know, at the conclusion of the meeting, you know, we'll make. Um, available the subroutine specifically related to the layer zero in term and sure. focus on this passivity and then uh you all may want to have a separate offline right. conversation about you know which values um that are needed and if there's something that we could improve upon but by oh. sharing the subroutine you should be able to, to backtrack you know how that was what, what the logic was Okay. So, 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 I just uh, yeah. Oh yeah, certainly. But yeah. here is how, how we how we did it. But it was um, it was trying to minimize um, having to change the actual transport equations uh, very much. At least the you know the solving for multiple equations, what is it, nineteen and transport something like that. And so, uh, so but I would expect much more mixing in the open water, right? Well, and that, that's part of the idea, and you can say. Well, or diffusion or dispersion, um, or porosity even, you say, oh, well, in groundwater, you say it's 0 0.2. Well, if you say open water, it's like 0 0.9, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you're gonna, for that open water portion, now when you've got a thickness weighted thing, um, you're actually increasing the porosity for the overall water in that cell. But you're also increasing the amount of flow. The, the overall, Amount of water they're moving faster from the cells, anyhow, mm -hmm. just because they're in the wells. I don't have experience in this area, but is there a precedent for combining this this uh, surface water layer with a groundwater layer? Another precedent. Um, and I would expect quite a bit of discontinuity at the interface. 
where you would have, you know, it, especially laterally, you know, much more mixing <clears throat> in the open water, and but you're yet you're integrating vertically. Right. Um, well, no, you see, they, I, I guess they, when I, I took all the equations kind of out of the code and say, laid them out for one of our uh, previous models we used to work here, and we actually looked at it and said, well, will this adjustment to the processor diffusion work in this ratio weighted uh, test? Uh, ideally, it's, there may be more accurate solution, but it's definitely better than ignoring the open water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for that. So I see you, you call the title of crossing of the layer zero. What the label zero is the overlap flow on yeah. top, right? Yeah. yeah. That should be the part you want. It, the well, it, 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 the one. it may not be exactly one because you have the uh, stuff growing. Oh, you mean the plants? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But ideally, like you're right. I, when, when I was testing the thing, I put in one a lot of time. So you get 0.2 in the so that's thickness uh, and one in the open we, water. If you kind of plants for the process of reduction, that could be a, a huge variable, right? Yeah. So yeah. plant that. that is all, the, so again, they're, those are all fine tunable. You can, wow. And you can change them by model, though. Okay, very the impressive. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's interesting, but it actually seems to make the, um, the movement of the water quality more work. You'd expect in open water areas. Um, this is the uh, specialized transport handling for water management district practices. Uh, in general, transport um, uses source water quality defaults to reference water quality in CWAT. So if you're moving water and you set your reference to fresh water, or uh, talking about. Uh, <coughs> 1025 or something like that, per parts per thousand. Uh, we uh, almost pure water. Um, so the source and sinks may be combined using the uh, source and sink mixing package or some auxiliary parameters. And those can be set on a daily basis as you go through. But when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cells that are uh, ideally source and sink locations, we set up some sort of bulk conditions where um, specifically in RDF and the diversions, where we take the source water quality, whatever the water quality is the day before for those cells, we're going to apply that to the sink locations. So we're not specifying in the source and sink, we're using it based on what the yesterday's or the previous stress periods um, concentrations were. Um, so that actually is, made things quite a bit faster. There's even a uh, something similar done in the group package at GHB. GHB is where I've got the general idea for uh, initially because there is a, an implementation of it in see what may. Can I stop for just a second? I'm having yeah. a hard time visualizing the process. So let's pretend you have saline free groundwater at oh, the okay. surface. This actually shows some of that. Okay. All right. And you load it with a foot of you know, 25,000, yeah, salt water. You're integrating that layer, you're combining those layers somehow. Yeah, you're adding the water, the mass of the water and the solute get applied to those cells. And distributing and then uniformly it, over the vertical, your um, salt content. Yeah, we, we, the, the assumption would be that it would be distributed evenly over the vertical, the saturated thickness and the open water in those particular cases. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this particular instance here on the left is actually showing one of the issues of what we're saying. We're going to transport fresh water into these, these are diversion cells. So we're going to outside the model someplace. We have a basin that has runoff, and we say, oh, we're going to put it. Here, so all those cells getting fresh, fresh water, essentially pure water, and when I mix it, it turns that whole area very, very fresh after thirty-two years. <laughs> it got very, very fresh. Um, and on the right, this was where we said, "Oh, well, we're going to take the source water quality, or a, de a defined, um, in which we can define, like in the parameters, or 
we call it auxiliary parameters. So if it's an external source, we can give it a predefined water quality and it's going to get something like this. This particular location now is grabbing its water from, uh, I think, Lake, Lake Okeechobee water. And because that's much fresher than this particular area, even though well, it, it basically turned it into fresh water, that in this particular case wasn't quite as much. It did freshen it, but not by not turning it pure water. <laughs> it was left in basically the source water quality. And the, the sinks were mixed properly. Yeah, I have another question regarding. So you have a wildland period. So wildlife, wildlife can predefine where the wildland. Yeah. But why do you deal with salty that you don't know where the salt water goes? We don't know where the salt water goes. Yeah, they, they only follow the land surface elevation, right? So it's before you run the model, you don't know where would no. be salt water. Oh, right. Yeah. So well, now how do you apply your wildlife? Right? Yeah. Now how do you apply your is that part of the wildland privacy or is, no? But the, How do you model that part? Oh, well, first of all, the, the initial water quality conditions were set up as through the treating process. And one of the things that I experimented with, at least with what we started up with is we had point source locations for water quality and later one at data was Creek. We said, oh, well, this is a good starting point for water quality. And just an example, we haven't done a calibration of it yet. I said, you know, ran it through 32 years of stress periods. And say, oh, well, now I have water quality that's a little more stable. I use that as a starting condition. And we try to run it again and see how those particular things look. Some of them match a little closer with uh, how water quality changes over time. But some of the things we saw, and like you do in any kind of water level calibration, but from a water quality calibration, if the initial is way, way high and the observed is lower, Say, oh, well, it comes down fairly drastically. It's not immediate. But when you have less of that initial condition changes versus observed, it's like thinking you're starting a normal right process. And now all of a sudden, now your trends can be closer to expected. So, like I said, the actual calibration of some of these things, there's a lot of dials to turn, especially like with the porosity dispersion and diffusion. Um, that's certainly opens it up for, like I said, the modelers to do their hard work. So your C1 model has five layers. Yeah. And you have layer zero on top part of this C1 model. It, that it's right? kind of a pseudo layers. It's really, um, with the wetland package, I called it layer zero just to uh, identify the properties in the BTN. That kind of BTN package needs something to say, oh, Porosity is going in layer zero. Well, I wanted to make sure that I maintained the original layer one porosity. So each stress period, I say, okay, how much is open water? How much is layer one? So it's a saturated thickness in layer one actually thins down. There's no open water. In, so go back to the original point two. Yeah. You know, so salty infusion occurs only in layer one. Is that correct? No, no. Yeah, I mean, anymore. I mean, uh, oh, in the wet. Yeah, the wet. Wetland transport of you know, open water would only happen in layer one. But my question is, you don't know where the salt water intrusion would be. Oh, yeah, it could even upcome. Yeah, so, it's, so you cannot use your wetland package to, uh, to predict that thing. You don't know the, that. Oh, no, no. That's not no, part no, of the no, I suggest that. No, no. The, the wetland package is just an extension to the LPF. That's all it is. Yeah. So you you predefine or you don't need predefined. It just uh, well, and there is predefined yeah. right now. Yeah. Part of that is to identify yeah. the differences okay. in the you know the specific yield and and the right. conductance in the monk surface. Yeah, I have no problem. They, they, like I said, these guys are much more familiar how to tweak that. So no, no, I I have no problem with the wetland. I just yeah. just uh, you know think about it. If the sea level rises, I have a part of a land now well, flooded yeah. by seawater. Yeah, and that was the one thing that I was. Thinking about when Jeff and I were talking the other day, we said, you know, there's going to be areas where we might have seawater coming in that's not in a wetland area. It's not a big reach to say, oh, well, it's not in a wetland area. Right. Uh, why don't we just allow that open water to now have transport um, with that porosity zero type of thing uh, that we did before? And 
just for that portion above land surface, you know, so we'd have to see what it looks like. It's very simple tweak in the code, <laughs> make it make it work everywhere as opposed to just what the boundary. So that has not been we haven't yet? tested that yet, no, because we haven't we haven't simulated anything yet with uh, the sea level rise condition. Yeah, I, I feel like um, this is really important, but it, it's going to the functionality would be important when we get to the model application phase. It's really not on the calibration side because I don't know that we have any wetlands where we've documented that we've got surface water basically being salty. I oh, think, right. Yeah. I think this is. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is. You're, you're you're trying to allow for the functionality if it were to happen somewhere, well, and then, this is but but there's really no way for us to calibrate it per se because I don't think we've got that feature yet in within the model domain. You got it. so when there it, it seems to me it, once we have the actual data to support looking at it, I think this is certainly something that's all reasonably calibrated. Um, well, and then as a final step here is basically to show that all of the um, water management district packages um, with the weapons were incorporated with transport. And this, I think, if I recall, did I lose some? Oh, yeah. So this shows initial conditions. I think I mentioned this before. We, were, we started off with some initial creek water, water quality. We ran it for 32 years. This is what the water quality uh, looked like after the simulations were done. And it's not an ideal way to do it because there's still stress that's going on from pumping and other types of things going on. But and then we were, took that as an initial condition. We ran for another 32 years, and um, it's pretty much stabilized. You can kind of see some uh, things along the edges, the coastal conditions where it might have changed a little bit, but uh, kind of gives the demonstration um, how some of the ways we expect to see. Things happen, but who knows when we get the real stuff. <laughs> I look forward to it. And it's actually in action. So this so, is also uh, a freshening, and it, it's just an ex yeah. I guess it's a thought experiment, but it's well, and this is also, also only looking at layer one as well. So a lot of this is uh, areas where there are open water conditions going on. Uh, looking at layer two is also very interesting. Uh, it doesn't show as much of this freshening uh, types of, uh, going on. So one of the things to kind of know is that we haven't finished building the model yet. Okay. So we don't have all the pumpage in there yet. Okay. We don't have, um, you know, all of the versions and the RDFs moving okay. water. Okay. I was wondering what would cause. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you see like the freshening that you wouldn't expect. Okay. So you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, and I've, I've learned this from Jeff over the years. Sometimes when we're trying to simulate these things, the, um, the output is stubborn. It like, in other words, it's not really showing uh, movement of, of, of salt saline groundwater, you know, for a variety of reasons. The code should be capable of, of simulating it, and, and it's not for whatever reason because of the conditions. And I think what we're trying to get from this slide is that after all of these code modifications and incorporations of all these packages, and do we have a code that is capable of actually simulating transient dynamic water quality changes within the model domain and i think that's the main point of the of the slide and the answer is yes but we are far from you know getting to the point of having a calibrated model we've got a ways to go but is the code capable of simulating water quality changes and i think that's what this slide is showing and i think the answer is yes yeah. and, and when especially like in areas like the diversion stuff where we we actually move really salty water into something just, just, just for fun. <laughs> it's like you put really salty water into a pressure conditioning. It's like you see things getting more, more feed. Yes. Um, the next thing, just as a follow up to the actual code changes and, and the test to make sure that everything's working right, um, I ran through all 20 cases that are identified in the uh, published version of this. See what we used here. Um, I compared heads and concentrations using post processing tool. We have ideally, it's like you subtract heads from both runs from different layers, different time, uh, time steps or stress periods, it should be zero. And 
and the other. And virtually there are no differences. I did find a couple of minor instances where there was very, very tiny differences. But, um, tracking down some of these weren't a priority at this point. Very simple to find them. Uh, example problems of cases listed on the right. Um, on top of that, I mentioned earlier, we compared simulated results to the lock, uh, lock the hedge model, the North Palm Beach area, um, with previous non uh, transport or non seawalk code. We also did the ECFM, which is the East Coast Florida model, which was based on pure seawalk 2000. Um, compared to the results there, those were all identical. Um, one of our other modelers, Sunpon, was nice enough to post process the results with the um, the Henry problem comparison here actually shows the see what on version four in red and the 2022 uh, the head contours here line up perfectly. It's a metric one. Let's that up. And in the, uh, uh, the simulated concentrations are on the right side, uh, and they're they're also coincident. Uh, this shows the elder comparison. I think you guys probably. Familiar with that, talking about fingers and stuff, uh, but these also lined up identical. Just an example. Uh, I think we have another stuff, and then the conclusions. Um, I briefly read through this before. So, um, the C by 22 created uh, using C by 2000 and existing uh, district uh, module packages. Um, to achieve the uh, desired functionality based approach to the code modifications, this uh functionality performance at each step. So it's like I would definitely was checking to make sure that we got expected results uh, in a stepwise comparative and executables that were actually available and valuable in the actual process as we were starting to do code for model development. Uh, using the existing model model. Uh, over a portion of the ECSM model very favorably, like I mentioned before, the North Palm Beach area, very BCF and wetlands with LPF wetlands, or the, what's the next one? Oh, successfully uh, demonstrated the code's ability to pump water quality changes over time. Again, those are still to be calibrated, but did see that it was moving water as expected, water and transport in value. Uh, and we did the published problems as a comparison test. So as the bottom bullet says, C 22 is therefore demonstrated function as designed and its basis for the ECSM uh, project. And I do have additional documentation. I'm just going to finalize a little bit. We'll provide that through the web board. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, so for the test, the only problem, other problem you to demonstrate your your modified code could duplicate exactly what C1 yeah. does, right? So, yeah. but those are the existing benchmark problems. Yeah. I think uh, uh, Dr. Graham also mentioned, do you have any new test to prove your code is working with uh, something like a web lab? I understand what you're saying. Well, we didn't have an existing uh, an analytic problem or another source for it transport you know in wetlands we, there wasn't anything really available for us not that i'm aware of uh, it's certainly possible, possible something exists but i haven't seen it yet and i'd like to just follow on to that a little bit so the you know the test problems that appeared in the original publications as far as i know there are no sinks uh no there are no uh, set concentration sinks or anything like that. Oh, in, in some of the test problems, there are. There in the the C what there's. It, let me see if I back up here. Um, the C what version four examples on the, mm -hmm. the bottom seven. There are some sinks and notes. Um, I'm trying to think what they are. I mean, I you know I was an author on that, and so was Wei Jing, <laughs> <laughs> my graduate student and postdocs. I don't remember. There being any kind of point sinks or anything like that, and I guess I guess my main point is like, uh, and you know, I want to talk to these guys. I guess before we make this a big deal, but like, you know, I think toy models that kind of really go after specifically testing a specific new process or something. I, you know, when I see the whole 
domain being used in a test and it kind of looks like it. That's nice, but it's very complicated too. You know, it doesn't kind of get at the heart of what the change was sometimes. And I'm so, and this, the way this uh, sync thing, I don't quite understand what you did yet, honestly. And so I just, I'm not sure that uh, the, that the test cases really address it, you know? So. Oh, I see. And, and you know, the, the, the sinks that you're talking about is like, they shouldn't have been affected because they could have been simulated exactly as they were before. Mm -hmm. The new thing with the diversion package and the RDS, those take into a different type of source and sink. There's actually different IQ um, values that are used for those. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that they are separate in that sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you had a more, uh, whether it's an analytical target or something, yeah. I and mean, now is all we really have is okay, we have some yeah. calibration targets. And Maybe I can. Please, yeah. <laughs> Probably that's a he can be using the word sync because there's a package in the MTC called yes. sync in the software package. Yes. yes. It's not sync. Sync is a while you each yeah. retard yeah. boundary condition. Everything is specified the input configure over that package. Yeah. It's not a real thing we call the thing, but you know, MT3D has that smell. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, <coughs> he was talking about the package, you talk about oh. the real thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that, uh, yeah, that so, helps, yeah. yeah. So that's really that's the input in the MT3D that's uh, yeah. they call the thing in the source package, and then the yeah. version we actually call them sources and things, yeah. version, um, right? Right, right. I think that's the conclusion, but, yeah. And yeah. Also, I mean, I just maybe okay, maybe it's still there, but this whole issue about using the previous day's concentration to, as a sink somehow, uh, oh, that's the source. So, so what that means is. We're looking at the previous day, like, for example, if I'm routing water from an STA into the water conservation area, we don't want to use fresh water as the um, water quality of the source of that water that we're putting into the water conservation area. We're saying we want to use the water quality from the STA on the previous day and move that concentration into this sink, which is the um, water conservation area. Okay. It's just a way for, and I think, yes, the source and sink word being in there makes it a little bit confusing, but we're basically saying don't move fresh water in, yeah. move whatever that water quality is in that location over. The reason we have to make sure that happens is because we know there's conate water. Lake Okeechobee is showing it. <clears throat> the um, I think it's water conservation area two is showing it. We needed to make sure we had a way of capturing that conate water. And if it moved, we need to see it move. Okay. So that's why we're doing so it. So it's not a mathematical sink in the MT3D oh. process. No. no. It's, a, yeah. uh, it's literally us saying that a water this, sink. it's a water sink. So it's like the cell that I'm moving water from and the cell that I'm moving the water to. And, and what we originally noticed when, when he first did this is that that water that was being moved was basically 100% pure water. Mm -hmm. That one was showing up in the code, and that's why we had to implement this okay. another process. That makes some sense, yeah. Yeah, we saw everything basically go completely fresh, and we're like, that's yeah. not what's happening. <laughs> oh, and I think that's your issue today, where you saw things getting a lot fresher than you expected. Part of the problem is we don't have a, uh, we didn't have an ideal ETM recharge data set yet. In that particular case, the recharge was uh, exceeding the actual ET. So yes, it would gradually get fresher over time. So are your STAs wetlands in the model? Yes. Yeah. And the concentrations in those STA is a dynamic. Yeah. yeah. Um, very well. Is the STA in a layer one zero or layer one? <laughs> layer one. Yeah, layer one. Yeah, there's really not a layer zero other than to say, oh, we're gonna layer zero is just what properties do we want to apply to open water? That's all layer zero really is. It's to account for water quality, it's to account for transport within the well. Yeah. There is no layer zero. No, it, it's the, a layer zero properties yeah. that get applied to open water in. Okay, is it, is it layer zero you use to respect that the parameter for open, open water. Flow. Yeah, okay. exactly. Right. So when we built the model, the model is just layer one through five. Yeah. So it might be helpful if you sort of 
could capture in words and some documentation what each of these test cases was designed to test. And what was it testing and what were you expecting and what and here you have maybe they know more than I do, but we're parachuting into this, you know, when you guys have been working on it for years. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean for all these tests, I mean means that they the use of map MT3D is synchronous source package, but they are not synchronous source. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, like a hungry problem, it's solving intrusion problem. Mm -hmm. There's no, nothing there, but you have to use the MT3D single source package to satisfy the boundary computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, so I really, you know, <coughs> kind of interesting to see if we have any testing of the real thing, you know, like a, what you added to it. Mm -hmm. uh, only you show right now, I can see uh, you didn't make a CYR model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. yeah. And more anxious, <laughs> which is not a trivial <laughs> point. That's, that's <laughs> true. That's true. <laughs> but did any of these <laughs> evoke <laughs> your change? No, <laughs> I was getting unexpected results. I went back and I think I found that yeah. I had misallocated an array mm -hmm. and the reaction package. Well, it's something we haven't used in ECSM, so I wouldn't have found it unless we actually used the reaction package. In um the, the test case oh, so like fiction that thing that was, like i said before it's, it takes a little bit to track down where what exactly variables cause them to be slightly different and but it is, again those i think the reaction package was like in the hydro point one or stuff like i forgot but yeah it's like once once that's fixed it, oh, boom, again instant that results so so I think what I'm hearing is if there is a field problem or analytical solution somewhere that documents saltwater transport in open water, that that would be a good thing. Open water and saturated. Right. That right. that would be a good thing to try to test the code on. I don't know if that exists. And quite frankly, it's really not the main thrust of what we're trying to do here. I think I think having that functionality could be good in future applications, but we would have to do some research to find out if, if such a, a data set exists. And then if it did, then we could test the code, but it really is not the main thrust of what we're trying to do here. I think it was to account for the fact that in wetland systems, beneath wetland systems, like in the Everglades, there is conate water, and we want to have the functionality that if that conate water made it to the surface in the future, that, that the code would allow for that transport but i don't know that, that that i don't think that's occurring yet it could happen in the future but i think that was the reason you know when when you're coming up with a work plan of what you're going to do to you know have this new version of CWAT to do what we're doing i think that question came up and someone said yeah if there's some sort of a way that we can account for saltwater transport within the wetland system that that would be a good thing to do and i think that's what kevin's done but i hear what the panel is saying is that there's some way that we can test that if there is some other example problem somewhere or a field example that to try to test that 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 would be a useful thing to do but that's that's what i'm hearing from the panel your point is well taken though it's not a key relevance right now necessarily so you know i think we could take that into account too okay. <laughs> and, and so did you add both transport and variable density flow with the wetland package or yes. was the transport piece already there yeah. oh no the transport wasn't there yeah. that might be the a little transport. easier to find something the transport on. was in lpf but and wetlands is just an extension of lpf the, that is there is some extra um movement of this water before it actually gets to the equation solving So these examples here basically showed you didn't break CY that's, or you that's... fixed what you broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But did they that's invoke a... any of your new it, it, none of these uh, none of these do none of these actually invoke any of the new diversions or uh RDFs all them. But the, the other, when you talked about the other models, the, the Waxahachie model yes. in North Palm Beach, and you mentioned the East Coast Florida mm -hmm. model, we had examples of the output from those modeling efforts with an earlier version of CWAT. Running that through the CWAT 2022 code produced identical results. So, so once again, I, I think that falls in the category of we didn't break anything, no, but no. we were able to replicate what was done in those other models. Okay. 
Well, and, and, and I even so I can force the North Palm Beach model to, to be variable density. Said, oh, well, here's an initial water quality layer. I'm going to run an uncoupled VDF model. I think, well, how did density affect the heads? And they, they worked as expected. I mean, you know, as you know, I you'll see what code at the beginning. Of the most concern to me is someday later people say the code is wrong. Oh, right. Yeah, you know, I give that code free to you as yet to publish. I didn't ask any penny. You know, I just words memory would be five years later, someone said I code wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, say. Find something. <laughs> but that never happens. 20 <laughs> years later, it happens. So that's why we pass all the weird problem. We yeah. even like a holy problem. We run this way, we run that way, we run back and forth. That used to start picking the whole different column and uh, make sure it's no bug, no big bug. And, uh, so that's why I'm concerned about it. You add new packages into a lot of work that has to be done. I just, you know, need a little bit more to find some uh, benchmark from. So to right. prove, that, you know, what you're work, working mm -hmm. in. And otherwise, you know, I, I don't say you get, a, you know, someone later on call you, oh, Kevin, what's wrong? And so, <laughs> I only get one call from Jacksonville and he said, that boy, it was wrong. Uh, <laughs> so he doesn't believe uh, the what the pressure can be expressed by the pressure of the head. Oh, he said uh, it can be can, cannot be done. So you're wrong because you see yeah. why you pressure of the head. Yeah, he said what well, the pressure you have to use pressure. I said no. <laughs> yeah, he called me. We argue for two hours. So we <laughs> 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 well, in, in for your in, in, uh, for your defense, I guess if anybody does talk. I didn't clearly document all of the places where I where I touched the transport oh, loads. Okay. <laughs> so no, I know yeah. I, I believe I trust you. And I just uh, or see, you know, you list all the testing example. Yeah. I just like to see the all, all the panel, I guess, like a diagram of measure. Do you have a testing problem or a benchmark problem? That's a key issue for any code development. Okay. Yeah. So you never know some of the tricky parts, you know, so it's just uh, it's kind of a comment. It, the, uh, also, I've never actually seen a benchmark problem for the weapon package. <laughs> well, that's the history stuff you, uh, you can check. <laughs> I think the problem, I, I don't know, I, I, I didn't work on wetland a lot, but, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's called, but it must be somehow you find the trail data to testing and to verify the that thing works. Right? So, I mean, for the diversion problem, the, the package is the easy. You just move water from one cell to another. That's yeah. nothing you, you need to, to verify. But uh, for the wireline, how the, the flow and the transport interact with the saturated zone, that's a pretty, pretty tricky and uh, important. Yeah, yeah there's probably even issues if you wanted to really, really fine tune or get into. Like you said, a benchmark problem. There might be reaction stuff going on and everything right. else. So who knows what? Yeah, no, right. how, how complicated it <laughs> get. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed a little bit, but what about some of those tracer tests that were done some years back and they were measuring like Peckley numbers out in the, the marshes? I don't know exactly where, but I know those occurred. Do you remember those? Mm -hmm. uh, no. They were done by the district and so there were some papers on them or you know, some reports anyway. And trying to look at transport, we put the, the new uh, new stormwater treatment areas. They were following tracer releases moving down through there, but I mean, it could it might just be an end member. There's not, probably not going to be any groundwater data, but you could just try to do the surface part. Uh, you know, have, a, have layer zero be all of layer one, I guess, essentially, right? Okay. And be interesting to see what, what you could find that way. I saw some of them, and uh, they are actually good in especially specifying on the porosity um, and how fast it will be going from one to the other one, and uh, if there is kind of uh, potential flow or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So, so these wetlands are multi cell, right? It's not just a single cell wetland. And you have lateral transport, so you transport in the wet, or only in that top integrated layer. No, no, transport can happen in all five layers, but no, no, no. I mean, well, the above so ground the water. There, yeah, the open water is just identified in layer one. Um, it's a portion of the water that's above the saturated. There's a topo, I guess. Because in real life, well, I don't know about the vegetation. Let's pretend there were no vegetation. You would have 
much more mixing laterally over that wetland area than in the subsurface. But yes. you're, you're yes. mixing yeah. it yeah. over the whole layer one in proportion to that mm -hmm. weighted dispersivity or whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the thing, though, too. You're also moving a lot more water. The volume of water is much more significant in the open water portion than it is in the saturated zone, too. So. And we have a high porosity, so we have more water above ground. And we still have catalytic in there moving the, the, the you know, the, the direction and the, the speed. So we're using a lower flow equation to actually physically move the water. It's just that the mass is assumed to be all layer one and layer one. Uh -huh. And on the other side, we also try and... So, so just a second. So the hydrologic processes are separate. It's a transport processes that are integrated. Um, we you're moving water differently, yeah. So, the, if you above the ground, the below the ground, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but water, you're removing water above moving the ground, faster, the same. you have more volume of water, now you have a different density for layer one for layer two. But the density for all of layer one is the same, identifying the amount of solute in the open water and the amount of solute in the saturated thickness, right, are separate now. Water in the open water has a higher porosity uh, than the 0.2, for instance, in the saturated areas. Averaging those porosities for that whole thing, I'm saying this whole chunk now has been the thickness weighted, water thickness weighted, uh, average porosity, and then dispersion, all of them taken together. And we say, okay, now we're moving this much water, this much site, right? And it's using this adjusted porosity. So it's, it, it's assumed they're pretty much mixed. So I feel like we've got this new functionality that we don't have field data to test whether the code actually can replicate that. So I don't want the whole, you know, 99.9% .9 of what we're trying to do here is not related to that. Okay. Okay. I, I, so, yeah, so I, I, I want to focus us back on the part that I think is really important, which is the variable density and transport within the groundwater system. And I, I, I would like to kind of almost isolate this particular issue because it seems to have gotten a lot of <laughs> focus and attention and rightfully so and and i think we can do something in parallel but i don't think during the calibration period or even during our our 20-year look ahead that the transport within the open water portion of the wetlands is going to be anything of significance it could be something that is important for a future scenario if we do a 50-year a look ahead and we're talking about, you know, perhaps, you know, not saltwater intrusion in the aquifer, but sea intrusion into the surface, into like a coastal wetland system, that that would be something that we would want to make sure we have that functionality. But I think that is, you know, the, I don't want to say extreme, but the, the most intense of the cases that we're looking at. So, I would, I, I think we could take the homework assignment that we're going to look for some field examples where we might be able to test the code, but I don't want the panel to get too sidetracked in that when I think that's just one smaller facet of, of what we're trying to do. And as long as you guys are comfortable with that, and it, it, is there some, Kevin, I'll just ask you, is there some way that we can actually turn off that functionality? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just one little parameter in the VPN. I love the okay. In other integrated surface groundwater models that I know of, I, I've never seen the surface system mixed with the whole first layer. More often, yeah. I've seen like a, a transfer coefficient. You know, you're maintaining a concentration up here, and there's some whatever, you know, mm -hmm. some transfer of mass across. But, yeah, well. Yeah, I agree with the chief. Maybe yeah, but it's I do. not a key not issue to block your progress. But I do, for example, uh, do, do you have a maximum 
code with the DJ. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, so can you do a, a testing problem compared to code? What was that? What was Max, that? Max, 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 yeah, that's, I think that they have a Mac flag. They can more similarly, something similar to the white light. Does that do, does Mike Shee, Mike Levin do transport? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So they have this all important everything and uh, all free flow. I, I don't know free flow, how, how good to handle the surface water. But Mike Shee, Mike Levin, Mike Flood definitely can. You have a code, very expensive code. Uh, I guess if you have that, just create a testing simple testing problem, run the okay, both right. code to see. Okay. I guess you get something okay. uh, credible. <laughs> Right. This is an idea. I don't know. Yeah. That I would be a solute yeah. transport, not density different. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Not have density. Oh, okay. Yeah. It would be helpful for getting some of the you know, parameters more, yeah. more likely to be closer to both calibration and stars. Yeah, I think the district definitely have a, the, I, I think oh, the PCB, they, they have a, yeah. that license for that. I'm not, I'm on, right? Yeah, I really, I really don't. <laughs> I just saw. It. I don't know. I I don't have a license. I used it before, but I don't have a license. Like a ten thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, very expensive yeah. thing. But, uh, yeah, and so you know, so that's you can print something like simple demonstrative, you mm -hmm. know, to test. Yeah, there's a couple of people in. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. hey. Any further questions from the panel? Well. But we're moving right into the panel. Well, we've started the panel discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in uh, we're we're at the end of the morning session here now, so this is the opportunity for the panel to give some what you've presented thus far. If you have any additional comments or questions for us, um. I feel pretty good about most of what I've seen. I think you guys are making a lot of positive progress. And looks like you're in a good place to move forward with what you're trying to do. I guess so. So afterwards, we'll be talking about calibration plans. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Session. Session. And, uh, I've already heard a little bit, and I'm curious. So look forward to hearing more about it. But by and large, uh, I feel like it's a pretty good program so far. So. If I come up with anything else as I look through these, or I'll, I'll mention. But I think it's been nice to be able to comment the whole way through. It's a little more immediate, and I, I prefer it personally. And I'm sorry for being a little slow, but did we, this is what I think I saw today. And tell me if I saw more than it. So you have these particular packages that you develop for your purposes. And you just wanted to make sure they could handle variable density and transport processes. So that's what we've seen so far. The specific. WMD packages have had that added to them and they hooked up with CWAT and it didn't break. Okay. Right. <laughs> Got it. That's, that's <laughs> uh, yeah, I have one more, one more yeah, question regarding because of the fixed chemical price is well known. It's a very highly promising principle. That's a lot of the caves, uh, the holes, like the teeth, right? It's mm -hmm. like a so to show that pictures that so yes. uh, every time why when we apply math law or CWA to this kind of problem, the flow will jump in the question. Are they done? Cars cars or okay. how you use math math law or CWA do the same? I mean this problem definitely I think you know will write to that. And, uh, so I didn't hear any discussion, you know. Of course, I'm the fan of Mark from Siwa. I, I use that <laughs> for class, like, no problem. But you definitely, a lot of people raise that question. So what's your take on that? Or what, what, how are you going to define that question while using a, a course media code for this kind of highly customized algorithm? Well, I think my initial comment would be, I mean, we have used uh, CWAT for the Florida Aqua model, and there are certainly um, some layers that are, are highly transmissive, perhaps not as, as transmissive as, as the Biscayne Aquifer, but we have used it successfully. And I think at a regional scale, when you start looking at these types of, of situations, that the model behaves more and more 
like porous media, but porous media, but in, in an individual location that's uh, 50 feet in size, um, I, it could be that mod flow or see what doesn't actually do a very good job at that refined scale, but at, at the thousand foot by thousand foot scale, I think we're reasonably confident that, that it can handle, um, even with those extreme transmissivities, that, that it can handle um, that feature and the fact that, you know, at that scale, I think a porous media assumption is, is reasonable. But it's when you take it at a really smaller scale that I think um, that it's possible that Montflow and Siwa wouldn't um, or might have some challenges in particular locations. But we have seen um, on the Florida modeling exercises that um, in, in those cases where transmissivities are large as well, that it's done reasonably well. But I we certainly grant that at a very small scale, much smaller than our regional scale, that there could be issues. But uh, but I think. That's been observed in modeling, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, and no one has decided that Modflow and Seawalk should be thrown out in the garbage. I mean, I think it's 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 been especially at that regional scale that I think it's successfully been applied. So majority of the year that that will come up that's a classical thing yeah. yeah it may cause you some trouble in the calibration if you have point measurements of right you know solve develop solids or something that yeah that's mm -hmm. typically that's the way we call it average property so if you yeah. the good side is big enough you average out this uh you know specialized as a whole or not whole. But your observations aren't yeah, yeah, so, always. Yeah, you have to big enough. I suppose you mentioned that like the point that yes, be big enough to, uh, to see the energy property of the thing. Otherwise, you think it's focusing on one point that could be just red falling into a hole, right? As it then becomes surface water. So now that's a lot of applied model. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's I think I didn't hear that. So I so, Definitely, you know, I think that that was if that the model be revealed by other people. You know, every time I see that, that question. So, so just to follow up on that, uh, Jeff, we, we had a an earlier version of the model that covered just the Lower East Coast, and that was in 2006. It was called uh, Lower East Coast Regional Model LECSR, and Jeff was the primary author of that. We actually went through a peer review for that model in 2006, and I don't recall that uh, there wasn't solute transport or density bend flow, but just in terms of regular mud flow, that was a regular mud flow model. I don't recall that there were problems in terms of achieving calibration in those southernmost areas where we had extremely permeable viscane aquifer. I think at that, again, regional scale, we think it was 750 yeah. square feet. 754. 754. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't recall that you had any problems in calibration at that. No, we Did had you? we we didn't have any trouble calibrating and not necessarily the district officially, but um there's been a lot of work done at Turkey Point, which is a superficial in the Biscayne. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of transport models that's been done down there. They are all successful. And so we we've, we've dealt with you see these really high transmissivity hydraulic conductivity values down at South Dade many, many times. And we really haven't run into a problem. And as Pete mentioned on the Florida, we have a very, very high zone of uh, hydraulic conductivity in Martin County that also was able just anyway, actually upcoding quite well in that in that area. Of course, it was well. I guess that, you know, all of the Point you get made is maybe somehow integrate into the documentation, you know, so, sure. yeah. so the so okay. the better now to ask that you know, like Jeff mentioned the turkey points. Oh, that 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 model was criticized by a lot of people using model for this kind. I reviewed model just I reviewed that comments. Right? So but anyway, so yeah, maybe this uh, add to the discussion okay. or something. Thank you. Any other questions from the panel for the morning session? Plenty to talk about in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then we're going to move now to the public.
comment. So this is the opportunity where the public will have a chance to comment on what we presented uh, thus far this morning. Uh, just a couple of reminders. If you are participating via Zoom, you use the raise hand feature um, and we will acknowledge um, you in the order in which you raised your hand to comment. And if you're participating via phone, uh, star nine raises your hand and star six mutes or unmutes your line to speak. Uh, when you are called on, please state your full name and affiliation prior to providing comments. Uh, we can, we have enough time to allow about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of commenting. Each person will have about three minutes to, uh, to uh, present their comments. Um, I think we're ready, so I'm not seeing anything in the chat, and I know the bond is on standby to unmute anybody if they're ready. All right, I'm seeing no hands up and nothing in Q&A. Okay. Okay, so. How about, I recommend uh, one hour from now. So at 10 to one, we'll reconvene. Sure. All right, so we're gonna break for lunch now and at 10 to one, we will reconvene. Thank you everybody for your participation this morning and we will see you at 12.50 a.m. <laughs>
Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to this afternoon's session for the East Coast Official Model um, Peer Review Panel meeting. Uh, we will start off this afternoon's session um, with the ED Recharge Program and Return Flow discussion. And Yergala, uh, you can go ahead and start presenting on the ET Recharge. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Yurgale Masenit, and uh, I'll be presenting on uh, ET Richard program. So there are only two slides. Uh, it should be pretty simple, and I'll make it even more simple. <laughs> so, <clears throat> oops, in the presentation. Go ahead. There, there you go. All right. So the ET Recharge program is a Fortran coded pre-processing tool. So uh, it's supposed to estimate vapor transpiration and recharge. That will be used as an input for the groundwater flow uh, model. And it has been um, developed uh, almost 30 plus years ago by a research on meeting is but since then people have been touching it and trying to fine tune. Uh, sentence. So the program <coughs> so for its uh, one uh, critical module, it's called Alcatraz Field Scale Irrigation Requirement Simulation uh, Module. So, uh, and also it uses the carbon number method to estimate runoff. Carbon number, as you know, is developed by uh, Natural Resources and Conservation Service. This is also called uh, soil water conservation service maintaining. So, uh, these are the two uh, major uh, utilities or major uh, components that we use in the research program. So, this is how the process goes. So, basically, the driving force is rainfall and return flow. So, my colleagues will be talking about return flow uh, pretty soon. So, the first process is to separate runoff. Uh, from rainfall and return flow. And that is, we use the curve number method right there. So once runoff is separated, we have effective rainfall. That effective rainfall plus other inputs of rainfall and um, reference ET and the data, field data and crop data are processed by officers. And we have as outputs groundwater, I'm sorry. ET and Richard, which is now applied to as an input, and these are the two packets which will be applied to see what. Uh, in addition, uh, the program also estimates irrigation demands, and we call it net irrigation demand, which helps us for planning and other purposes. So uh, that's what the process looks like. It's quite, it seems simple, but actually uh, takes quite a lot of data, uh, quite a lot of assumptions, and uh, quite a lot of parameters actually you know, in each of them. I mean, if you unpack everything, it will be this quite a little um, So AppSource um, <coughs> actually applies a root zone level water balance. So um, as you can see, the inputs are rainfall and return flows here. And the outflows are evapotranspiration, drainage, and lateral flow. Lateral flow is assumed to be zero in, in, quite, in the field scale and bigger scale. So, yeah. so that's assumed to be zero. But uh, this drainage is estimated like the net recharge. This drainage part is considered to be the net recharge. So it calculates. As I said, drainage and eating deficits from the zone, which we call it net irrigation requirement. Uh, for land irrigated areas, uh, the potential evapotranspiration is estimated to be reference heating multiplied by the crop option. So just um, very straightforward. And also on the land irrigated areas, you know, like the potential eating is the evapotranspiration from saturated plus unsaturated soil. So the groundwater ET, assuming it is from saturated, it will be from the potential ET minus unsaturated. But also just it's a balance, you know, like <laughs> what you want to estimate. 
for irrigated areas, uh, what we assume ET demand is met by uh, irrigation. And lastly, absolute is not applied on saturated conditions, mm, but the, this is conditional actually statement in the, in the, in the actual program. Uh, what it means is, so recharge is assumed to be rape, like in uh, wetland areas or inundated areas. So this rainfall equals recharge. You know, recharge is what mud flow takes. That actually when mud flow runs, because we give both recharge and ET uh, components, it does that balance, that estimate. But right here on the upsurge, we assume recharge to be equal to rainfall uh, and such. And ET assume the bigger part to potential ET. So uh, that's what I have. Um, so we do it uh, on daily basis. And we estimate, as I said, uh, not only the vast transpiration in the recharge, but also uh, the net irrigation demand, which serves us for planning and other purposes. And uh, I'll share while you continue on the report. Right. So you take uh, changes in land use and crop types over all the period of record into account? Yes. Mm -hmm. Say for this uh, actual model, for ECSM model, we use about six land uses. So from 85 to 93, from 93 to 97, and so on and so forth. Okay. So your wetland areas can't expand or contract over your simulation? It depends. Period? Because in some cases, those wetland areas they could be converted to uh, urban areas or like uh, developed areas. So, no, I meant because of excess inundation. Same land use, but it just the wetland area increases. So you would. If the land use itself changed from the photoimagery and stuff like that, they expanded the area of actual wetland acreage, for instance. That constitute on the wetland might expand there, but. The wetland boundary for the model yeah. is static. So you may make the wetland boundary bigger than what you need. And then for an asterisk uh, in particular, it's just using the acres of the model cell that are wetland. So just to clarify, over the calibration period, I think uh, I think Anushi is going to cover this in her slide, yeah. but we have um, land use maps that were developed every three to five years. Three to five years. And every time, as we go through the calibration period, um, when we get to that point, the updated land use map is imported. So if there is a, a, a change in wetland can only be, occur as a result of the change in land use, it wouldn't change as a result of iterations or time steps associated. So nothing, mm -hmm. if it's not what happened, can land outside of a designated wetland become inundated? I guess it's Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but right. it doesn't just have overland flow. It's just, yeah. but, it, right. but it won't it, have overland It won't flow. have the overland flow. If it's not within the wetland bone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's, I guess, what's my question. So it just, uh, we so can definitely have a boat They might just stack up that model. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I saw a teacher use the Blangy Cradle Master mm -hmm. as we are irrigating. So you are using quite different approach, are, are you? Yes. Yeah. So what's the advantage of uh, this new project compared to uh, mm -hmm. the planning cradle method? Why you switch? Oh, planning cradle we use in the past for regulation purposes, but so, yeah, Blaney, Blaney is used for regulation purposes. That's okay. how they decide your your agriculture landscape your demand. Okay. But they do that for your one in ten. Situation right? for the right? water use permits. Yeah. For the water use permits. Mm -hmm. Business. Go ahead. The, the other key is we use Penn and Monteith. That's what I was going to say. It uses something like land yeah. credit. Yeah, we yeah. use Penn and Monteith, which gives us a mm -hmm. better estimate of the actual demands, which are occurring in March and April and May, um, as opposed to Blaney, which is a pure temperature driven system. So our hottest time of year is August. So it jumps way up high in August, whereas Penman tends to push the actual irrigation needs back into the spring where it belongs. Let's see. Yeah, also, can you go back one slide? So, and, and the last word, you estimate runoff, where the runoff goes? 
there are no, I mean, uh, we are just using only for groundwater. So it goes oblivion, you know, like uh, anywhere. <laughs> so we calculate the runoff on a basin level. We don't and then what we do is we will attenuate the runoff using Muskegon or something similar. And then that diversion package that we talked about okay. for certain basins, especially if we're trying to calibrate the structure flow, we're able to set the sink into the model and we can bring that runoff in. Okay. So we'll attenuate it first, and then we'll bring it in. Okay. Otherwise, it's just, uh, it just disappears. It's yeah. Okay. Well, it comes back well, and calibrating the structure for us. Right. Okay. It, it disappears out of the model, but we still use. It. Okay. That's curious, uh, you know. So because you are using a groundwater model, so that's mm -hmm. saying you add the viewer doesn't matter, right? The viewer doesn't count you add whether or not, right? So, yeah. So if an atmosphere cell became inundated, then it would produce a lot of runoff the next event, uh, presumably. And yeah, you're saying so what, that what, what, is yeah. taken out of the domain. Yeah. Or, yeah. So AFSERS doesn't yeah. use the runoff, yeah. but we, outside of the ET recharge program, we will use the runoff because we need to know how much runoff is generated in order to figure out what's contributing to a structure. Right, so if you have like two days in a row with massive rainfall, the first day will fill up the unsaturated zone. That would just be basically full. The next day, whatever's left over after you, you know, bring it through the curve number, that amount comes into the model as recharge. It's pure recharge at that point. Mm -hmm. And then the rivers and the drains and everything else in Moffa will eventually get rid of it. That groundwater ET is really potential groundwater ET. Yes. Then upon extinction, death, and stuff like that. All right. And as your villain indicated, um, we are incorporating um, return flow into the ET recharge program. Mm -hmm. And so um, return flow in the ECSM model is defined as anthropogenic derived water being reintroduced into the saturated zone of the aquifer. And the primary uh, mechanisms related to this process include excess irrigation from agricultural golf course and landscaping needs, discharge from septic tank system drain fields, and disposal of treated wastewater to wetland um, type areas. So expanding on these three mechanisms, um, return flow for irrigation need, as you have indicated before, um, AFSERS is used to calculate the saturated zone ET and recharge rate for the model, as well as irrigation demands that are then implemented into the model via the well file. Um, AFSERS allows for us to specify the efficiency of the irrigation method uh, thereby allowing for the calculation of how much water re-enters the top model layer as return flow for irrigation. And we're also taking into consideration that throughout the model calibration period, we have um, development, uh, developmental land changes occurring, you know, land use types changing throughout the model calibration period. And so um, we're accounting for this um, and recalculating the irrigation demands based on these uh, land use changes. Uh, other changes considered include um, greater use of reclaimed water for landscape irrigation in the latter part of the calibration period, because of course, um, towards the latter part of the calibration period, more reuse um, availability came online. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, increased conversion of residential domestic self supply wells to public supply wells for irrigation associated with um, urbanization. So, um, expanding on the um, return flow and how it's going to be implemented based on residential septic tank system throughout our model domain, where there's still quite a few areas um, that are still utilizing our uh, septic. Uh, for wastewater. And so as a result, um, we have here, you know, the basic um, components of the septic system, you know, the tanks are located within the um, unsaturated zone of the aquifer um, and the septic drainage fields um, discharge some of this water into the, into the, into the aquifer. 
some of which is used by the plant for their um, ET um, needs, and some is returned to the, the uh, aquifer as part of the return flow component. So what we'll be doing is for septic, we're calculating this using the population of each land use type, which is then multiplied by the indoor per capita use and estimated percent fraction return to the unsaturated zone. And finally, um, Return flow as it's implemented are um, using our supplement, supplemented surface water systems. Uh, some examples of which include lake systems and wetland restoration projects uh, being supplied uh, water from wastewater treatment plants or from another alternative source or supply such as the Florida aquifer. And depending on the size and type, these systems will be simulated um, using the standard river and drain cell approach with the budget calculated to ensure correct seepage rates if the system is acting like a canal recharge system. Uh, for large created wetland systems, it will be simulated using the wetlands package with water inflow into the system coming from the observed values and as an, out and as an outside source. And then for the smaller lake systems, um, it's going to be simulated by adjusting the layer one hydraulic conductivity at the site and applying the observed flow volumes from the outside source. So as a QAQC, QAQC check to um, our return flow um, methods, um, what we will do is that all return flow volumes calculated by the methods discussed above will be summed up at the utility service area level and compared back against the difference between the utilities treated public supply flow and subsequent wastewater return flows to determine if it's reasonable. And then the primary calibration parameters would be the assumption of the areas being irrigated with public supply and the volume of irrigation and other forms of reuse simulated compared to the observed wastewater reuse plant flows. Are there domestic self-supply wells in the model as well? Yes, there will be in a well. In the well. And do they have return flow? So the way that that's going to be tackled through afters, um, because after is going to basically tell us what irrigation is needed for that particular area. Um, so we're not actually going to apply return flow on top of the irrigation requirement that afters told us. But yes, we will have DSS wells both. Um, so we've kind of gotten a coverage of the wells that are used for indoor use, as well as which ones are just outdoor use. And we'll, we're actually doing like a phase approach where we have coverages of utility service areas. So we know as the utility expands, then we're going to make sure, for example, if I look at Jupiter Farms, the town of Jupiter started covering them in the latter part of the calibration period. So at that point, I'm going to switch the DSS well from indoor outdoor to just make sure they're outdoor use only. And do the indoor ones have septic tanks ever? Yes, they have septic as well. So and same thing. If we know that they're septic, then we're keeping it septic. If we know that septic is now provided, we're going to tackle that as well. We have um, wastewater service areas mm -hmm. that have been, we, we reached out to municipalities and we have wastewater service area maps that have been digitized. And so we know where, where those service areas are. It's not always the case, but in many cases, you know, that, that's, you know, public. And sometimes there are septic tanks within that, but we, I think we have a coverage so that's, we can, you know, through the magic of GIS, separate those out and figure out exactly what, what comes, what's happening where. But it, right. it's it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, I think okay. you know, not too long ago, we were thinking, well, if someone's within the wastewater service area, then you know they they don't have septic tanks. But that turned out to be completely false. Yeah. There are plenty of places that even though someone had there in someone's wastewater service area, the septic tank still exists. So we, we so we got coverages of the septic tanks from the municipalities as well, and then we're able to figure out. You know how how each area is handling wastewater. 
So just to, yeah. uh, to continue with that a little bit, you don't you haven't really done any of that yet with the septic mapping, the return flow mapping. So. Not the return flow mapping itself. What we have is a spatial coverage of actually septic tank locations came from the Florida Department of Health. So they've been generating this just or Florida wide, likely septic, known septic kind of coverage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have that for the DSS wells. Um, we actually reached out to every permitting entity. So while the district oversees well construction permits in general, we have delegated agencies. So we reached out to each delegated agency and said, whatever you have, send it over. Some of them just had addresses, so we digitized those. Mm -hmm. um, others had uh, Miami-Dade, for example, for every parcel, they were able to tell us they're on sewer and they're on water or they're not on anything or they're just on water or whatever. So we have better information for some counties, but all that's been digitized. We just haven't gone through and done the return flow portion yet. All right, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it's, it really is complicated. You have to get the population and the housing density and stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay. Not easy. And, and, you know, with that, we have to make assumptions. Yes. Like and we are going a, to. A residence, you know, how many people yeah. are in a residence? You know, I think in, in West Coast, we did like 2.3 people per residence. And, you know, it, it's, yeah. you know, you have to make simplifying assumptions. But we have, you know, between the wastewater service area and the septic tank uh, areas, we're able to kind of figure out what, how each area is being serviced from a wastewater perspective and from that, figuring out what the return flow would be. It's pretty amazing. In Miami Dade, USGS has like 20 inches a year in some areas. You know? A return flow? Wow. wow. Which is remarkable, right? It's not going to be that way in most places. <laughs> wow. Yeah, oh, and we I think we did make some assumptions with like truly urbanized area where you don't see a lot of grass. Mm -hmm. What are they irrigating? So, you know, we're we're trying to kind of build in like a land use component as well um, and things like that. So we've, we've got a lot of ideas. We're just trying to get it all. This is the best way to implement it and not. One of the concerns that we have is if we put too much return flow in there, we're not gonna see the impact, especially from a planning perspective, if we're looking 20 years out in the future, we don't want it to be that we put return flow in and now we're not capturing the potential withdrawal effect. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a lot of pieces to kind of bring in here and make sure we're capturing it as accurately as we can. So, yeah. With that, um, so Alicia and Yergalom kind of talked about some of the input that you need for the ETV recharge program. So I'm gonna review some of that. So one of the things that we talked about was the land use. So yes, we are using six different land use coverages. Um, we have a 1988 map, which is applied from day one, our trust period one, January 1st, 1985, through 1993. The 1995 map goes from 94 to 97. The 99 map goes from 98 to 2002. The 2004 map goes from 2003 to 2006. The 2009 map goes from 2007 to 2012. And then the 2014 map goes from 2013 to 2016. And so this is just an example of what the 2014 land use coverage looks like. And of course, it's important to note, we needed to capture the different land uses because we've seen either ag fields becoming wetlands or the urbanization um, further inland, you know, things like that. We needed to make sure that we could capture all of that. And looking at the land use, again, one of our objectives with looking at the code selection is we needed a code that can model a wetland. Because if you don't include open water like Lake Okeechobee, wetlands is 39% of our model domain. So we really needed to make sure we had something that could simulate the wetland package. We needed the ET recharge to be correct because that's where we're getting our agricultural demands from. And that's 31% of our model area. The next highest um, percentage is urban and built up areas, which is 22%. And then of course, like my forested, non-forested areas and things like that are smaller percentages across the model domain. With the rainfall data set. So one of the decisions that we made was to be consistent with the two by two. And so we are using their rainfall data set. So it's what I call a district's rainfall data set. Um, on the all right, you can see the spatial variation of rainfall for 2001 um, across the model domain. 
And so again, it's a daily rainfall across the entire calibration period from 85 to 2016. So the way the data was derived for the two by two, um, from 1965 to April, 2002, they use gauge data and they use a 1010 interpolation technique. When you move into the relatively recent data from May, 2002 to December, 2016, they moved over to using NextRod data and they averaged the values to get the gridded two mile by two mile value. But we had to move from the two by two into our grid. So what we did was we used the nearest neighbor approach to move again from the two mile by two mile to our grid, which is a thousand feet by thousand feet. And then the other thing you'll notice is that kind of box down in the bottom. Um, south of Key Largo, we use rain gauge data because the two by two expected it cover that area. Um, so we used rain gauge data and we used TSIN polygons and inverse distance weighting interpolation to get that coverage. For the reference ET, again, we're sticking with what the two by two is using. Um, it's the district's reference ET data set. So what they're using as their reference crop is green grass. That's assumed to be um, a height of 0 0.12 meters, actively growing, well watered, completely shading the ground, a fixed surface resistance of 70 um, seconds per meter and an albedo of 0 0.23. It's, they use two meteorological data sets to get their data. Um, and again, as we talked about, they're using Penman Monty to get the reference ET. And so again, in order to go from a two by two data set into our grid, we use the nearest neighbor approach. And then of course, you can kind of see for 2001, how our reference ET data set looks like. So just kind of getting a feel for that monthly distribution of rainfall and, and reference ET. This is 1985 through 2016 averaged on a monthly basis. And it kind of tells a picture of, we can tell very clearly where the wet season is. You know, you see the most rainfall, um, June, July, August. And so you can also see the, the variation of the reference ET over time as well. And then here we have the annual distribution of rainfall in the ET. And so again, you can see very clearly we had droughts in 1989. We had another one, very hard to see, 2006. And then you can also see where the wet years are. And you know, our average is actually 50 year, 50 inches um, of average rainfall across the calibration period. And the average reference ET is 48 inches across the calibration period. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so then I'm going to start moving on into the input data set. First thing I'm going to talk about is the river and the drain coverage. So in the center, you can kind of see where we have rivers and drains. The rivers are in blue and the drains are kind of in the orange color. Um, so this was kind of the way we developed this coverage, at least for St. Lucie County um, down south is we started with the districts A had the hydrography data set that we have. And so we said, if it is a primary canal, it's definitely gonna be a river. Um, secondary or little ag fields and things like that are primarily going to be drained with the exception of the um, EAA. So the Everglades Agricultural Area, we are modeling as a river and that's because it's heavily managed. Um, you know, pretty much all of the little ag farms that are out there are held pretty consistent and we know what that operating stage is. So we're choosing to model it as a river. Um, one of the things that we still have left to do is you can see how dense the coverage is. And for one model cell, we have hundreds of drains and we don't wanna have that. So we're gonna go through like this is like, for example, in Northern St. Lucie County, every little tiny drain um, or ag canal would, would um, digitize into a drain cell. And so we want to make sure we clean that up and just have like the, the main ones. And that's what's going to end up in the coverage. The other thing to note is for the northern portion, especially in Indian River County, we brought in um, the drain and river coverage from ETFTX, which um, covers that portion of the model domain in St. John's River Water Management District. So we leveraged the information that we could for that northern portion of the model domain. Again, here's the wetland coverage. So basically what happens is in the, in the wetland eye bound, this is where we define where those wetland areas are. 
Um, and so we, we take the wetland coverage in, from the land use, and we say, if it's a contiguous wetland, we're going to define it in the wetland I found. The well package. So right now, we're, we mainly focus on the public supply demands. Um, here you can kind of see over the calibration period, we're looking at in the early 80s or the mid 80s, we were um, pumping about 800 million gallons a day. Um, as population and time increased, we kind of went up over the 1 billion gallon a day mark. But then in 2006, we had water shortage come on, more restrictions, more water conservation efforts and things like that. So you kind of see the demand tapering down again. A um, couple of things to note here. This is the demands coming from the surficial aquifer system. It does not include the warden and it does not include surface water, such as the city of West Palm, which is bringing in water um, through the LA tieback canal. The other thing to note here is that Miami-Dade is the highest user of that water when you look across the counties. Um, so Miami-Dade is using the most water, followed by Broward and then Palm Beach. And the last thing to note is you don't really see a lot of yellow on this graphic. And that's because you can kind of see it. Um, I think it's 1999, there's a little tiny line going across. Okeechobee County's water use, especially in the model domain, dwarfs what everybody else is using across the counties. So you don't really see it showing up in the graph. It did not exist pre-99. Um, they were dependent upon the lake. And so it's surface water and we don't include it in this official aquifer model, but you can kind of see how small their water use is compared to the other counties. And same thing with St. Lucie um, and Martin counties. There's a heavier dependence upon the Borden there. So their fraction is they are using in general less water, but they're also um, relying on the board and aquifers. Anushi? Yes. A uh, couple of other things happened in the 2007 timeframe. There was some water shortage, yes, but also was the housing crisis and that cut the demand. And then the other thing I think we in 2006 was the uh, Lower East Coast Regional Water Availability Rule that capped all of the users in the Lower East Coast at I believe it was the highest of their previous five years prior to that. So all of those users have been capped at that unless they could prove that the, any additional water that they're requesting is not coming from the regional system. So all of those things combined, mm -hmm. I think have resulted in the fact that from 2006 onward, downward, that um, the use has declined. And it's also increased reclaim water, mm -hmm. increased floor and aquifer use, all those things have, have tended to limit the amount of demands that are being met by the superficial aquifer system. Yeah, thanks, Pete. So then we went, um, the next thing is the initial heads and how did we kind of create that? So here you can see the initial head array for layers one, two, three, four, and five. The things to note here, um, again, with like initial conditions and how we kind of set things up, um, for, again, I, I think I briefly mentioned this in the, in the morning, along our western boundary, um, we have the L2 Canal and the Lake Kissimmee in the northern portion. So we're trying to match those, that's the stages that we started with um, for the initial condition. And then along um, the eastern boundary, we have tidal conditions, which I'll talk, to, talk about in a second. And then in the northern boundary, there is a small canal that kind of um, just south of State Road 60. And so for that, we actually had um, stages from the ECFTX model. And so we leveraged that information as well. So that's basically how we developed our um, boundary conditions and then our initial heads with whatever historical information that we had available. So that title boundary condition. On the left-hand side, you can kind of see all the title stations that we used. Um, it's a combination of information from Everglades National Park and NOAA's title gauge, title gauge data. But the important thing to note is we did some manipulation here. So the data set that we use is the detrended data. Um, so we took that and we superimposed the sea level rise trend. And so we knew that we didn't want to kind of have a flat detrended data in our calibration period, because over time there has been a gradual shift in the sea level. 
So we use um, NOAA's trend line and superimpose it on our detrended data to get this example, for, for example, is Virginia Key. So that's kind of how you see the calibration period looking. And it actually results in about 0.2 feet um, of sea level rise over the course of the calibration period. Any questions about that? And then the last part, which I know Pete has kind of mentioned a couple of times here, is the development of the initial water quality array. And this took quite a lot of work. Um, the biggest issue that we had is it's the first time we've ever tackled water quality in the superficial aquifer system. And when we started pulling the data, we noticed that the measurements were all over the place. Sometimes we had chlorides. Sometimes we had specific um, connectivity. Sometimes we would get lucky and actually have TDS. And so we were like, okay, what are we going to do with having all these different measurements? We have to convert everything over. And in the Florida models, it was easier. We kind of used a standardized conversion. You can't do that in the superficial because I have very fresh water. And then um, east of the intrusion line, I've got, you know, the higher chlorides and TDS. So the first step was, okay, let's pull all the data that we have. So the various sources that we used, um, the regulatory database from the district, that has data that was entered by water use permittees. So they submit their data, whether it's monthly, quarterly, sometimes annually, but whatever they've submitted, we pulled it. Um, we also pulled DB Hydro. So DB Hydro is the district's database, but it's a compilation of various sources. So it could be USGS, it could be the district, it could be Everglades National Park, Army Corps of Engineers, whatever um, is available in DB Hydro graphs. We also pulled um, information. The Army Corps was doing a study on chlor or the chlorides around Lake Okeechobee. So they had a bunch of wells they had selected just on the outer edge, and we pulled that as a separate data set because it was not available in DB Hydro. Um, we also looked at FPNL's Turkey Point water quality data. Um, so we pulled that because that's hypersaline. We knew we needed to kind of get a feel for where that was. We also looked at FIU's database for Shark River Slough in Florida Bay to get some surface water um, water quality. And then in addition to that, we had USGS reports. Um, we had C51 phase one studies. We had district reports from the water conservation area too. And what we wanted to do was we had to figure out a way using all this data, um, how are we gonna use this to develop our initial water quality array but get all of this data into TDS. So what we did was we pulled historical data pairs. In order to be a data pair, you have to have both, in this specific example, a chloride measurement and on that same day, a specific conductance measurement. So when we queried for those kind of results, we ended up with 3,658 data pairs across the model domain in various layers. We didn't want to apply the same um, equation necessarily in layer one as layer five if it didn't show that that was the right thing to do. Um, and once we had the data pairs, we basically separated out into 37 bins. So I had about 100 data pairs in each bin. Um, and so I, we just kind of set the bins based on where the data was just so they're grouped by similar value. Once we had the bins um, created, we took an average chloride value for each individual bin, and then an average specific conductance value for each bin as well. So now I had 37 chlorides and 37 corresponding specific conductance values. Using that, we developed a regression line. We stuck with linear regression, um, predominantly because as I went through this process, I met with the Water Quality Bureau that we have here, and I kind of said, okay, you guys have experience doing this, which I didn't really have time. Um, and I said, how do you know? Why are you choosing linear? Have you seen that, you know, a quadratic equation might fit better? And he said, no, we've actually found that it doesn't make a difference. And linear is just so much easier to work with and manipulate that, we're, that they've always stuck with a linear regression line. So that's what we chose to do as well. And then based on the data, we realized that in the lower chlorides, anything less than 250 milligram per liter, that main one regression line did not fit. There was so much error involved there. 
So we actually developed two regression lines. One, if your chloride was less than 250 milligram per liter, and another one between 250 and 8,300 milligram per liter. The 8,300 is actually um, the conversion factor. So when I met with water quality, they said around that mark of the 8,300 is when it's easier to straight convert from chlorides to TDS. That's when your constituent is predominantly the salt and you're more comfortable converting straight from the chlorides to the TDS instead of worrying about converting from chloride to specific conductance and then to TDS. So we got those regression lines and, and we kind of said, okay, the fit was about, I think my R squared was at 0 0.97 and 0 0.98. So we felt comfortable with the way the data was fitting. Once we had a conversion from chloride to specific conductance, we said, okay, well, I still need TDS as my outcome. So I had to figure out how to move from specific conductance to TDS. And that's generally not a regression line, it's more of a conversion factor. Um, so in this process was pretty much the same. We pulled again, historical data pairs. So this time I had to have a specific conductance value and a TDS value, same location, same day. We again grouped everything into bins. And then we looked at the range of specific conductance values for each bin and an average ratio was created. So we looked at, we basically looked at the ratio and um, use that ratio to determine the conversion factor for converting from specific conductance to TDS. And so with specific conductance, unlike the chlorides, it's not just one equation. If my specific conductance value falls within the first range, it's one conversion factor. If it falls in a different range, it's a different conversion factor. And we did that for every single measurement. So you can't kind of make a blanket statement of this well used this conversion factor. It literally depended on day to day where that where that particular measurement fell in the bins. And then we said, okay, well, we have to verify and make sure all this stuff actually works. So that's what the FPNL Turkey Point data was used for. The nice thing about this data set was I had data ranging from 2011 to 2019, but it had all three measurements for every single data point. I had chloride, I had specific conductance, and I had TDS. So I thought, okay, perfect. I can make sure that all of this stuff actually validates. And I had a very nice range of data. So just in the chloride alone, I went from 12 milligram per liter all the way up to 39,000. So I felt comfortable saying, whatever I'm gonna find in this official aquifer, I'm gonna find in this data set. So it was a really nice data set to work with. And let me go back. What we actually found is my equations kind of work. The problem is I am introducing a source of error. Every time I convert, there's about a 10% error that I'm potentially adding in. And that's something that was very important for us to take note because we're now going to convert everything over and try to calibrate to match these converted TDS values. So that's something um, that I'll kind of bring up later when we talk about the calibration criteria, but something to, to really kind of take note when you're trying to convert a 12 milligram per liter value into TDS and then try to calibrate to that value. So to develop the initial water quality array, these are all the points that we kind of utilized. Um, the purple dots are water quality wells. It's hard to kind of see from over there, but there's little green diamonds and those are DB hydro surface water points. So they're surface water locations, but they're providing us water quality data, especially in the park and thing, areas like that so we can capture that water quality. And then I also have um, little blue squares, which are FIU surface water points from Shark River Slough and, and places like that. So um, we pulled all of that for layer one. Layer two, three, four, and five, I only had the wells, of course. And so this just kind of gives you a feel for we tried to find as much data as we could out to the west because that's kind of where the data is lacking. Um, but we did know there was some conate water that's been spotted out there. So we pulled, you know, we leveraged as much information as we possibly could. So here we've got layer one, layer two, layer three, and then layer four and layer five. So each of these points for that particular layer was used to ultimately create the initial water quality array. So here you can see 
the initial water quality array for each layer. Um, the oranges are kind of your fresher, orange and the clear, the white, I guess, is kind of your fresher water. As you get into the blues, you can see the, um, the higher chloride, higher TDS water. And so as expected, as I get down to like layer four, it kind of starts with layer two and three, but as I get down to layer four and five, you kind of see that Kune water popping up um, just on the south, southern, southwest edge of Lake Okeechobee. Yes, you, please. Do you want to describe how you got from the uh, individual data points from the wells into this array, like the sure. aging technique that you used? Thank you for reminding me. So what we did was with, when we had all of these points, we basically pulled the earliest data point that we, they had in time. So whether it was 1970, 1985, 1990, whatever it was, that earliest measurement we could find, that's what we used. And so we said, okay, we basically developed a point coverage where we said this particular row column layer has a, a water quality of this. And that was the earliest measurement. And then we created it. So the creed results are what you see here. And so I think we're kind of seeing what we expect to see with along the coast, we have higher um, higher TDS, and then it's a very sharp interface. We jump into the fresher quality water. Um, you know, when we have the estuaries come in, um, we see the, the um, higher TDS water and things like that. So I think when we developed this, we felt comfortable with how it's looking and it kind of showed some of the things that we were expecting to see. Yeah. Yeah, when you mentioned the use of earlier so mm -hmm. data available, if you but if you're starting ahead, initial country should be the January 1st, 1985, right? So if you have data from 1940, and also you have the data of 1985, which one you use? The 1985. But it's not early. Yeah, so. it's, not, it's not, we didn't let it go all the way to the 40s. We basically said, what's the closest to 1985 okay. that we had? But if it was a particular well that had been sampled, let's say 1970 and not sampled again, I still leveraged the 1970 information. Yeah. Yeah, just another point. Um, and I, I think you all know this is that you know the quality of the data gets worse when you go back in time. They they simply didn't have as good quality control procedures back probably in 85 compared to what they have today. So, you know, even though you know we're starting in 1985, the beginning of our simulation, but recognize there's probably fewer data points back then. And the quality of the data back then is not nearly as good as it is over the last 10 or 15 years. So that I hope when we start getting to the point of presenting our calibration results, that you remember that, you know, the point I'm trying to make here, which is that the quality of the data back then just wasn't as good. We didn't have as good QA, QC procedures in terms of water quality. Admittedly, things like TDS and chloride and such, it's 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 harder to make mistakes on that, but that they are there. So just remember that as we're going through this, I, my, my guess is that we're going to have a more difficult time achieving calibration in the earlier portion of the calibration period, simply because the data probably is not as good as, as the more recent data. Yeah. Yeah, I think you choose the close to that date. That's yeah. 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 So yeah, especially you deal with the shell item for the chloride mm -hmm. TDS ratio can be uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so. And that was um, even for kind of like the, the saltwater interface, we did find some historic, I think 1989 information. And so we leveraged that, like that was kind of something that we compared it back to to say, this is where the interface was located back in 89. Are we kind of matching that type of area? And so we did some of that cost check as well. So these are the same data you used to develop the relationships between chloride. No. Yeah. So this data is from whether it's FIU, DB Hydro, EMP, everything. What was used to develop the relationships was strictly DB Hydro because it has both measurements, um, except for the validation, which was the FPNL Turkey flip data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, going from 
if I'm taking chloride as TDS, there's kind of a pretty heavy assumption there, right? That it's going to be a sodium chloride dominated water. It makes a lot of sense in the coastal and shallow marsh areas and estuaries and everything, but is that borne out by the conate waters too? Like that the we're worried about inland? Uh, is it always chloride dominated by the, the anion? I mean, I guess. So we, I did talk to um, the Water Quality Bureau about that. Yeah. And so that's kind of why he said, okay, in the wetland areas in particular, you worry as if the chloride is still below the 8,300 threshold. Once it gets that high, like the chloride value gets past that 8,300, yeah. you know it's the salt. Um, but everything below them, that's why he suggested going to specific conductance first and mm -hmm. then converting it over to TDS. So that's a two-step process. Hmm. So I guess um, in the work that he's done, he's found that that's been the more consistent way of tackling the anions and things like that. But hasn't somebody looked at like the water types? I mean, maybe someplace they're bicarbonate dominated or something. We did look at that as well. So we looked at which areas are bi uh, like bicarbonate areas. Um, Sulfate, I, I think, was the other yeah, one. Sure. Was that what? I can't remember off the top I think of my sulfate, head. sulfates are more indicative of the conic water in them. Mm -hmm. So we, but we did an analysis to kind of compare the different, like regionally, mm -hmm. the different areas to see if that had an impact on the relationship or the conversion factor. And we didn't find a significant relationship there. So I think once we did all of that and it, Actually, what happened was I created the equations and then I handed it over to them to do their testing to see if the relationship held. And he felt comfortable with the statistical analysis that he did and looking at the regional areas of, of what I was trying to model and simulate that this was the best approach that we could kind of get. So, um, I think it, it kind of it goes back to, you know, what's the primary purpose of this model. And so we do recognize that there is conate water inland, and we do want to try to um, have the um, abil model's ability to simulate that. But the primary focus really is, you know, saltwater intrusion from the coast and its potential impact on, you know, water supply. Yeah. But we do recognize that there are, there is that conate water further inland and we want to Capture it in some way, but we don't. We didn't want to compromise by by looking at that and perhaps focusing on that. We didn't want to compromise our ability to evaluate what we're truly concerned about more so, which is coastal saltwater intrusion and the effects of sea level rise. Yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, but that's something that we did look at. I mean, I think what we had originally considered is okay. So maybe we can throw in an extra equation to consider it's inland as opposed to a coastal, um, you know, a coastal well. But because we found that there wasn't a statistical difference there, we said, okay, well then why would we factor that in and, and add additional error to our conversion potentially when we're trying to calibrate the TDS? So you mentioned that you have the 37 being south of so while you do the calibration, you go back to ECB to check where the data from to check the CO. No. no, so we're not going to do that. What we, basically what happened was we created these equations, we validated them, made sure everybody was comfortable with them, and then um, within Kevin's group, they wrote a script that says, in the array of historical water quality data, that's where we go and check and say. If it falls into it for the specific conductance of TDS, for example, depending on which bin you fall in, there's a different conversion factor. Right. So the code was written to say if the value falls between whichever one, use this conversion factor. And that conversion is taken into account when we get to TDS. Any other I love creating as a interpolation method, but I guess it's if I, I always like to see the semi-variograms too, you know, and I think people just kind of jump right to it without really looking at them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if maybe that's something we'll ask for just to see what's underlying it. Sure. Yeah, Rob, I mean, based on the distribution of the data points that extrapolation, say in the lower layers, four and five is 
probably pretty uncertain. You could also look at the yeah. uncertainty right. around. Well, that. and and the thing to note yeah. is this is kind of something that we might tweak during calibration. So this is by no means final. Um, you know, I, I think we're already seeing that there's probably going to be need to be some changes made here, um, and that's going to be because, for example, if I have a data point where my earliest data was from '99. Uh, was there any change that happened back in the 80s? Do I have leverage to move that? What was the potential error in my converting things over? There's just so many factors here that we still have to play with to, to get to the landing point of this is our final initial water quality array. Honestly, I hope it will flush out literally, <laughs> you know, that you won't have to worry too much about the initial conditions. Right, later. right. Yeah. So are you treating this as deterministic then in your calibration? I don't know that, that we are. I mean, I think, I don't know, what would you say, Jeff? When you have the creaking error. Yes. That you There's have. a lot of error. Yeah. <laughs> we, we covered the water quality conversion error. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, I think from our standpoint, there were areas that we knew we had to kind of get right. And that's basically along the coast. And then we wanted to capture the conate water that we know exists. Um, and then everything else, we're basically kind of, it's very similar to the hydraulic connectivity. Go through, have we found any new information? Has anybody else been out there drilling wells and getting water quality? Um, how does that look when we're looking at our initial water quality array? Are we expecting to see differences here? Um, things like that. So, I think another thing here is like, like in terms of layers four and five. You know, there aren't. I mean, I don't think we have a, a graphic that shows the wells per layer. Yeah. Do we? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, oh, okay. the number of wells in four and five are much less than in one, two, and three. I mean, so I, I, there, that introduces some level of error as well, is that, you know, there just aren't that as many sampling points as there were in some of the overlying. And areas. so what you can kind of see is in this, in, you know, in inland Miami-Dade, I don't have a lot of points, but when I go here, I've got a lot of streakiness in the, from the creaking. Mm -hmm. So that's all stuff that we're kind of working on to get it to be a better fit. So maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but you could use that as observation error in your calibration process. You can use the creaking error plus whatever other error is. Kind I think of. ultimately what we end up doing, I mean, we there's clear errors. We got this blue dot in here in the middle of Dade County, which is obviously wrong. Um, so, you know, we got to clean out the errors, but what we ultimately end up doing is probably running the model with no stresses to try and get it to stabilize a little bit better. Because, you know, as Pete was saying, you want to get so many wells. And what we did is we had to come in on the east side, I mean, on the west side, and and control those wells. So we put out a whole bunch of fake, you know, fictitious wells all along in there, or else the creaking is going to end up in the middle of the, you know, you're going to have poor water quality in the middle of, of the conservation area. Mm -hmm. so, like like so like a couple of slides that I had shown, it's like about after 64 years or something. You can see that it was a little more stable, but that is. Then you go and take that layer, you can go and put your initial water quality points back into it and adjust or warp that again. It's, it's a new starting point. So that it's, that this is that giving the model a chance to uh, shift it around a little bit. Um, it's probably more hydrologically sound than just frequent. We definitely want to get your input on this. You know, this is something that, you know, we've got some ideas, but we definitely, you know, and we'll, we'll put those down on, on paper uh, so that you can really, you know, digest them. But, you know, because of all of this error, we, we, we need to figure out a way to deal with it. And so if you have any ideas, um, we're, we're really looking to, to get that from you because we're struggling a little bit with it because as you said you know as we're looking for some of these there's very few data points you know in some of these areas over large areas yet that's what we're trying to calibrate to and because of these conversion to common tds value 
the, the paucity of data points in certain areas, we're, we, you know, we're open to any ideas you have to try to best deal with that. And then, you know, we haven't got to the point of what are we going to use as calibration criteria, granted that all of this error is present and we still need to deal with it somehow. And we were looking for the best way possible. And if you have any ideas from your regional water quality modeling experience that you can share with us, you know, this is kind of, this is new for us too. This is changing quite a problem. So moving on, our calibration plan. So our proposed calibration procedure is kind of two-phased. The first phase is a manual calibration with an initial sensitivity approach. So that initial sensitivity approach is we kind of run the model, the traditional sensitivity analysis, figure out in the various regions, what is the most sensitive parameter, whether it's hydraulic conductivity or leakants or um, what have you. Could I ask, when you say traditional sensitivity, what do you mean? One at a time sensitivity? Yes. Okay. So it would be one at a time then we would kind of know, again, what the model is most sensitive to in general. Our second phase is where we bring in PEPs and we use PEPs to evaluate the overall model performance. And the reason that we do that is it, we kind of make the model the best that we think we can get it. And then PEPs comes in um, and we do like a global sensitivity analysis to figure out if there's anything that could be improved upon. Um, one of the issues that we've had in the past with PEPs is that it's not compatible with most of the packages that we use. So even if we ran it, it wouldn't be able to tell us how to best optimize the wetland um, parameters or you know conductance for the RDFs and diversions and things like that. And we've actually, over the last few years, run into several problems by going down that route. And what we found is utilizing past the end to kind of say, okay, you guys have tried to calibrate and it'll tell us ultimately have we reached that kind of fine spot of the model is as basically as good as it's going to get. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we use. Just a second though. I mean, I haven't used it extensively, but doesn't pass like write any, isn't it completely model independent? It writes any kind of files that you right. would ever want to write. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can't understand why it would be incompatible. So it doesn't allow my understanding. So we, with the West Coast and ECFTX both, we attempted to use PEP. Um, and I think the results that we ended up with, the first problem that we ha what had was that it can't, you cannot use the wetlands package. It won't, it won't run for whatever reason. And so, um, so Dave Welter is the one at the district who kind of runs PEST yeah, for us. Yeah. And in order to run PEST with the Lower West Coast model, we had to convert every wetland cell into a drain. Mm -hmm. And it just, for the model domain that we have, and with 40% of wetlands, we're not comfortable converting everything to a drain. That doesn't, yeah. it doesn't intuitively make sense to us. So um, yeah, he, he hasn't been successful using all of our other packages. Um, kind of with pests. And he keep asking me to specifically compile the code so it would run in Linux. So it has the wetland package in it. It has, you know. Yeah. Yes. So what he does is he can run it. He just does not change the parent. Like he doesn't identify those parameters as something pests can optimize. Hmm. That's kind of seemingly like by choice, though. I mean, from what I know. Hmm. How that thing works. Yeah, I could definitely touch base with him and ask. I mean, I, uh, I agree. I don't have a whole lot of experience, but I thought it was more of a wrapper. Yeah, than, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, my understanding is that it it is a wrapper and it runs the model with whatever packages you have, but it doesn't have the capability of modifying the parameters and packages that it's not the non-traditional packages. So it'll modify or optimize the parameters for your rivers, your drains, your hydraulic conductivity, leakants and things like that. But my understanding is that it can't touch the RDF package, the diversion package or the wetland package, which unfortunately in our case is the bulk of the model domain. 
So, um, but I will definitely follow up with him yeah. about that. Also, your model takes uh, 16 hours to make yeah. a run. I mean, if you run past, how many years you want to run? <laughs> <laughs> That's where you can use the parallel processing <laughs> model all at once. That's well, what we so do. The, the reason I know this was an issue is because this is, we attempted to do this with the locks of hatching model too, which is a much smaller model. The calibration takes, I think, only two hours to run. And we ran into the same problem. It didn't work with the wetlands, the RDF, and the diversion. So we actually, this is the same approach we used for the lock the Hatchy model successfully. Um, what we did was we calibrated the model. It was a manual calibration. We then brought in PEST, and it's basically like a method of Morris um, global sensitivity using PEST. And um, Dave Welter kind of goes through and sees which um, parameters his, I guess it's PEST plus plus technically that he uses. Um, that which parameters he's going to vary. And then he goes in and comes back and says, hey, we ran it. And it came back as the same overall mean error. It's pretty much as good as it's going to get. Or he'll come back and say, hey, we did this run and we found that the mean error could be reduced or and things like that. So that's kind of how we've successfully been able to use test. Um, everything else that we've kind of tried has been unsuccessful. Have you talked to John Doherty at all? I mean, I know he works closely with St. John. I think yes. Dave, yeah, because Dave, Dave and John together oh. wrote PEST++, plus plus, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, and I think we actually, the modeling unit took a training with John Doherty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same thing was discussed. So there has to be some kind of limiting factor there. But we'll definitely look into that. Some of the dynamic data sets are very difficult with pests as well. You got 12,000 stress periods. You can't, it's hard to deal with the ETM and recharge that type of stuff. So, with our phase one primary calibration, um, we wanted to kind of go over with, with you some of the actual parameters that we're going to be tweaking. And we do, we're doing that as like a three grouping of three. The first thing we're calibrating to is the water levels. And so for the water levels, the like parameters that we look at are both static and dynamic, obviously. Um, it includes aquifer, horizontal and vertical hydraulic connectivity, the recharge and the ET rates, um, pumping distribution by source and by well field. That's especially critical in the earlier time period where we don't have pumpage by well. And so we're making blanket assumptions of evenly distributing pumpage across the entire well field. And if we have a monitoring well nearby, we'll see that, oh, in fact, they didn't equally distribute the pumpage. So that's a calibration factor. Um, and then, of course, any other variables, depending on that sensitivity run that we do in the beginning to see what the model is most um, sensitive to. And, and, and also in the northern portion of the model, your main source of water is either going to be surface water or the floor. So the source becomes an issue in the northern portion of the model. When you say you're going to calibrate recharge and EQ rates, that's the stuff coming from absolutes. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier about the quality of the data on the on the water quality side. You're pointing out some you're, in your example. You you covered the other thing that we struggle with is that the the quality of the reporting on the pumpage in the 1980s and 90s is not nearly as good as it is now. Now we, we we pretty much always get per well pumpage. Sometimes back then they didn't require it. Um, sometimes they required it and didn't report it. And there's a lot of blank spots. Yes. And so what Anush, Anush is pointing out is that when you look at a monitor well, it's in the vicinity of that well field. Sometimes you can see that uh, if you if you distribute all the pumpage uniformly, that monitor well won't match up. And you have to kind of play with it a little bit and say, oh, it looks like the drawdown is a little bit more uh, intense there. It, it probably means that the pumpage was greater in the production wells closer to that monitor well compared to just making a, a simple assumption of spreading it out uniformly. So there's there's nuance there in order to try to achieve that better calibration, but it's because Again, the quality of the data back in the 80s and 90s is not nearly as good, but that's still part of our calibration period. So my guess is the quality of our calibration, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there right now. 
the quality of our calibration in the 80s and 90s is not going to be as good as it is in the in the 2000s just by virtue of the data not being as good but that you know we're, we're willing to live with that but just know up front that our statistics are probably not going to be as good in the early portion of the calibration calibration period however we have to go far go back that far in order to make sure that we have um, the transition of that the development and transition of the saltwater front to get us to the point where it, it corresponds with when the data is just much better. Ronnie, what are your calibration and validation period? 1985 to 2012, and then 2013 to 2016. You know, look at this list and think about you're trying to do what you're talking about, redistribute the pumping in a well field, it sounds so laborious and difficult to do. I, I, I think I would deprioritize that one if I were you guys, and just as my original thought here, it's like, that seems next to impossible. Yeah. So what we found is kind of, um, the way we calibrate and the spreadsheet that we use, it's pretty labor intensive to put together, yeah. but it's very handy in that we can quickly tell if it's an area around a specific utility mm -hmm. that's causing the problem. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to figure out, oh, hey, there's a problem with whichever utility mm -hmm. pumpage. And it's very quick for us to point out. Yeah. And, it, and we've had enough experience working with regulation that we're pretty efficient when it comes to redistributing the pumpage. Thankfully, not going one. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, but yes, it is. It is a difficult thing to do. Um, and we're hoping that one of the nice things is LECSR, which is kind of like the predecessor to ECSM. I think the period of record started in 1989 and we had pumpage on a daily basis for that model. And because it was well calibrated, that's kind of our starting point for the pumpage. Okay. Um, and so we know, okay, we got the distribution right back then. It's really 85 to 89 that we're concerned about. And then um, LACSR, I think, ended in 2005. Yeah. And so then it's like the 2006 to 2016. But at least in those years, they did a little bit better job in getting us the well by well. Um, now, when we move into like ag and things like that, we don't have really reported pumpage. So that's going to be a whole nother battle. But for the utilities, I think we should be okay. Have you thought about reversing your calibration and validation periods to calibrate when you have the better data? We've been we've been experimenting with that, you know. If we calibrate with the more recent data. Can we can we spin up the water quality data as a good starting point by then? I'm not sure. We have a lot of water quality stuff going on. <laughs> a well field going down. I don't, know. I don't know about the earlier years of their vacation. Mm -hmm. you know, the whole Hollywood Hallandale and North Martin, West. Uh, that had intrusion problems. Right. We can take a look at it. But, yeah, we can yeah. definitely look into it and kind of see where we're, where but we're I, Let's get the dialogue here. I, I think what we're in the earlier years, we're trying to spin up the, the water quality data to be somewhat close to the mapped interface positions that we have and so there's a there's a and i think kevin you kind of alluded to like you know you can you run through a period of, of, of time in the simulation and then use that as the starting point for the next i kind of think this is the same thing here is that the earlier portion of, of the calibration is probably not as good it's going to take time for the interface to establish some not equilibrium, not equilibrium, but some level of accuracy, I think. And from that point further on in the simulation, that would probably be better. So is, am I saying that right? Or I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So, so say it in, 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 in a, a better way than me. It, it's, it, to me, it's spinning it up to get close to what we what we think it should be. And it takes time to do that. But I think there's only one, one factor. You're looking at the interface. You have STAs coming online in 1999. You have all this dynamic stuff going on, and I don't know how you can verify to an earlier period unless you at least try to simulate those features somewhere at the beginning. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's just what, what, what I'm saying about what you were saying there is that yeah, if you turn off the diversions and the RDF and all that kind of thing, take out the wells and you run it with the water quality and the ET and recharge, let it see. Let's see what happens. Uh -huh. You know, you'll get through sharper interfaces along the coast. You may redistribute some of that water quality that's more inland. And then you say, okay, well, this is my initial water quality points. Let's punch those back in and like rubber sheet them. You know, if you will, to kind of bring them back a little bit closer or depress them again, whichever it needs, and then go and turn on the stresses and any other packages. Right, that's exactly what we did for the East Coast Florida. That's what I thought. And I think we ended up having to run it for, I, I it was forgot how long years. Angela ran it for, but like 500 years or something just to get uh, off of uh, the keys kind of reasonably decent. Yeah. Took a long time to get it up. But we did see a pretty nice looking interface. So after you know, after four years, four years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, for the water quality, obviously, any parameters that we use for water levels, and then additional parameters are horizontal and transverse dispersivity, boundary conditions, including the tidal variation, um, source and sink mixing package, and the initial water quality array, as we talked about, we're going to be looking at that as well, um, especially to to account for the conate water and then the coastal areas as well. And then for structure flows, that's predominantly control elevations of the secondary and tertiary canals, river and drain conductance, diversion and RDF operational rules for water movement, and then the curve number and then Muskegon for attenuating the runoff. Um, so those are the three kind of the, for the three types of uh, calibration that we have, the parameters that we're going to use. And then again, the global sensitivity analysis is the use of pests to run global sensitivity via the method of Morse um, to see if we ended up with a well calibrated model. So, the monitoring locations that we're attempting to calibrate to. I'm going to caveat this slide with this is kind of everything when we did a data dump, if you will. Um, for the wetland gauges, the groundwater monitoring wells with water level data and then or and surface water stations and then groundwater monitoring wells for water quality. We have not gone through yet and looked at is it good quality data? Are they, you know, if it's located next to a river cell and it's a water level station, would I really want to use that? Probably not. So then we sequester some. So we haven't done that cleanup yet. That's actually something we typically do right before we're done with final calibration. We'd like to keep all of the data in there for now. We'll look at it, we'll see how the model is comparing to it. And then kind of right before the end, we'll go through and say, okay, well, this well only has two days out of the 12,000 stress periods. I don't wanna use it to calculate a statistic. So that'll be in one kind of batch of sequestered locations. But, then- But you should another example that comes to mind is that you have, because we've got thousand foot by thousand foot cells, we could very well have wells that are in the same layer in the same cell. And sometimes we would look at that and say, well, which one has the longer period of record or which one has the, the better, better quality control mm -hmm. on the data that are in that well. And then we would pick one of those two uh, to be you know, the, the calibration target. And then we would discard the other. Unless that well happened to be so close to the next cell, we might you know, move kind of move it, all, move it over. But, but that's that's another thing that we look at is there there are certain wells that are actually going to be in the same model cell and then we have to if they're in the same layer oh, intercepting same interval we, we got to pick one well and also when you have a density of calibration points you're also biasing the calibration itself so or you have a better distributed rather than dense back in certain ways and going back to the equivalent forest media model if you had multiple good quality data sets you could average them. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. yeah, and I think we did actually when Jose was looking at developing our, our data set for us, that's something that we actually did look at too. Like I we had to prioritize if the sources of data were different, which one is more of a higher quality data. And so what we said was we appreciate the regulatory database. However, there are times that could be just somebody inputting the data. And a lot of times you'll go in and look at water levels and the measurements look off and it's because they entered depth 
that it's water instead of the actual water level. So there's things like that. We prioritize things. Um, yeah, so like if there's a USGS well and then a well from some water use permittee, 99% of the time we'll be going with the USGS well, just because we know the quality control is there. And things like that. So I think right now we're looking at, um, we've got, I think, 200 plus wetland gauges that we're trying to calibrate water levels to. Um, the groundwater wells and surface water stations, if I remember correctly, it's about 3,000 stations. And then the water quality wells um, is, I think, about 1,000 or 2,000, somewhere around there. So we're looking at like almost 6,000 monitoring locations that we're trying to calibrate to, which is an effort I don't think we've ever undertaken, so. <laughs> Yeah, Alumna, uh, talking about that, have you, what kind of plan do you have? I mean, I think back to the Miami Dade model again, they have uh, had hundreds of these long graphs with the whole record of the observed and the, the, calibr the calibration runs and then the validation periods. And there's some nice Python code for outputting all that stuff that maybe would be useful here. So we actually, thanks, thanks to Kevin's group, we have an amazing um, set of post-processing tools. Okay. Um, Kevin has written what we call RMB2, which is read mod flow binary, and it's the second version, um, which takes the mod flow binary output and then produces rasters. So we can bring everything into GIS for whichever stress period we want. It'll average stress periods if we want. I mean, it does head water quality. And it does it does, time series too. I guess that's what I was actually thinking of. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then um, what the tool that Jose has written um, and is currently working on, not only does it generate statistics for us, but it then uses that shiny app to bring everything into like a very handy online, I think, an online system where you can go in, zoom to like Miami Dade's only going to be interested in Miami Dade. So you can zoom into that area, see all our locations, figure out what layer it's located in, what our statistics are, and then plot a hypergraph. Um, so all of that is going to be up and running by hopefully by our next meeting, so that I can kind of show you on the fly that we can well, what we can do. I mean, it's amazing what we're able of able to do with all these post processing tools. So, um, and they spent a lot of time kind of developing that stuff. And, and Kevin actually has, we can make flow vectors. Um, we produce, you know, head difference maps and water quality differences and things like that. So we can really get a feel for what we're looking at. And then I, we talked to Jose about bringing in the saltwater intrusion lines um, for the mapping that he was talking about so that we can see like, okay, we saw that the interface was here in, 2009 it's here now in 2014 can the model capture that like we want to be able to see all of that on the fly on the system so that it's available to everybody who's interested in the model so those are all things that we will have up and ready for you guys to look at next time so those are the monitoring locations calibration criteria so we kind of um thought about all of the different calibration criteria we've used in the past um, with all the various peer reviewed models that we have. Um, typically, we always kind of say mean error of plus or minus one foot. At least that was what we did for LECSR. Um, and then the mean absolute error of less than one foot. We wanted to stay consistent with that. Um, the thing that we added in is something that we've done for the ECFTX model with where we said, okay, yes, overall, when you have 3000 wells, it's great to have all of the wells on average have a less than one foot mean absolute error, but on an individual basis, we want 50% of those wells to have a mean absolute error of less than one foot. And then 80% of the wells need to have a mean absolute error of less than 1.5 feet, which is a daunting task for us, but you know, I think we wanna feel comfortable in this calibration and know that it, it's a good product that we can use for water supply planning and also for you know um, climate change and sea level rise types of scenarios. So that's kind of the water level criteria that we're trying to achieve. Yes. So before we move to water quality, so I think 
knowing what we know about how the topography has an impact on water levels, I think, you know, without having done any calibration yet, that it's going to be more achievable for the Miami Dade wells to be calibrated to because the topography is so shallow. Uh, but it gets more challenging in the northern portion of the model domain where the topography has a much greater impact. And so I think we'll take that into account as we'll probably need to be a little bit more um, lenient on the wells in the northern portion of the model domain just because the topography is going to be so much different compared to Miami Dade where things are relatively flat. And I think you'll see that um, when we start printing out you know, uh, preliminary values to see that we probably are achieving it in Miami Dade and we may not be achieving it as well in the northern portion of the model domain where the relief is so much larger compared to Miami yeah. Dade. And that's just the reality of it. And I think in addition, things are pinned more by the canal systems in Miami Dade too. That's true. Yeah. Could you really condition it by sort of seasonal fluctuations or something? Yeah, and I think That's, so. One of the things yeah. that we kind of talked about is we know where the the Loxahatchee model it was calibrated to like I think 0.6 feet, and so that went up into Martin County. So we looked at this and we said, okay, well if we can do it into north into southern Martin County, then it's just that St. Lucie portion that we've really got to focus on, and so we're we're going to try. Um, you know, we we might be setting ourselves up, but we're, we are going to try. So, uh, no. so I have a question. So, so, so when you get this number, so you just determine by your group or you have to get a other number from the district or from or even so these are basically consistent with all of the models that we've done in the past. In, the um, in, in, the district. in our districts. Yeah. And then ECFTX, of course, was the three districts together, St. John and Southwest and us. So that color and why. No, yes. So they were at the one and one and a half. So to give you kind of a reference for ECFTX. Our 50% was two and a half feet. So within within the ECFTX model domain, which is St. Lucie County um, cutting across DeSoto and then going up to Lake and Seminole. Um, so that for that area, our 50% mean absolute error was two and a half feet. And then our 80% mean absolute error was five feet. But that includes the superficial and the Florida. Not it includes the superficial and the Florida. That's and and has rich and, and has been yeah, there are land yeah, right. yeah. yeah, my concern is you know you don't wait until you finish that stuff. Oh no, no, that's that's not right. what we want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we wanted to set we like to set our calibration criteria up front okay. so that we know what we're trying to work towards. Right. I haven't done any modeling down here at all, but that looks pretty ambitious. <laughs> There's like City Port Lauderdale's well for to say you now the drawdown in their well field. It's like 15 to 20 feet. So the head, the head elevation that you're calibrating to in downtown Fort Lauderdale is minus 12 feet below sea level. So you got you, there's some areas where you get some big swing in water. Mm -hmm. So for the water quality, this has been kind of where we're going to probably need the most of your input. Um, <laughs> say that. So this is the water quality calibration from the ECFM, the Florida model. And this was given to us by our peer review panel. Um, they kind of set forth this um, change. In, oh, wait, did I skip this one? No, you're either. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So they kind of proposed um, doing this calibration error band based on how the water quality in a particular well looks. So what they said was, okay, if your total dissolved solid is from zero to 4,000, your air band is smaller, it's plus or minus 500. And as you get higher in your TDS, your calibration air band increases going for saline water, um, plus or minus 4,000. And the calibration target is 80% of all the water quality monitoring wells will simulate a TDS um, within its individual calibration error bands. The other thing to note here is that we selected, we kind of grouped it into the category based on the average for the time series. So we would look at the entire time series of a well, and if the average TDS was 5,000, then it fell into the second category and my calibration error band was plus or minus 750. 
So this is kind of what we've used in the past for both of our Florida models, the West Coast Florida and the East Coast Florida. And that's what we had to work with for the surficial. But there's two kinds of things that we knew we had to worry about. First of all, zero to 4,000 is a very big range. And we're looking at the surficial aquifer. Yes, we know in Turkey Point, we're gonna get to greater than 18,000. We know off the coast, we're gonna get into the 6,000s and, and higher. But we also have a large amount of wells that are within the zero to 1,000 range. The other thing we thought about is, okay, yes, we have a lot of fresh water, but as we talked about, there's creaking error, there's conversion error, there's all this error. So how do I figure out what that calibration error band is? So I will say that this is just the proposed um, calibration error band. But what we're saying is for the fresh water zero to 1,000, our error band target would be plus or minus 500 milligrams per liter. And as I move up, it'll be plus or minus 750, plus or minus 1,000, plus or minus 2,000, and so on and so forth. The key change that we're, we're planning on making, if you remember back to Pete's slides where he talked about saltwater intrusion and when the front moves in, we saw that well kind of staying at the chlorides of 50 to 100 milligram per liter and suddenly it shoots up, which would mean that in the beginning, it starts off in the first bracket. And as you go through time, it kind of moves its way over. So what we're going to do is every single monthly value we have, we're going to say, okay, this month it's 50 milligram per liter. It falls in this bracket. Next month it shot up. So it's now 1000 milligram per liter it now falls in this bracket and do it on a monthly time scale instead of a overall average time scale. Um, and then again, of course, 80% of our water quality monitoring wells need to meet that calibration criteria. So that's kind of what we've proposed. Um, I don't know, we're, we're open for discussion on that um, to figure out, you know, what's achievable. I think this is the first time we're trying to do water quality in the superficial aquifer. We don't really know what is achievable for us. With the water levels, we're pretty confident because we've got all these other models in the area and we know what we can do. With the water quality, we really, we don't know. Um, and so we wanna set the calibration criteria up front without knowing what we can do, but we also <laughs> don't wanna set it up so that we fail. Um, you know, so it, it's been a, a discussion that we, we talk about often, what's reasonable and how do you know what's reasonable? What do you need for your planning decisions? I mean, what is, is there some, what do you need? Water standards? I mean, <laughs> excellent question. Good question. I, I actually don't know. I don't know that we, we have one. It's the first time we're tackling it for the plan too, which is no. not really, there's a lot of firsts going on. Well, I can see, you know, most of the water sample, you know, more probably in the first bracket. Mm -hmm. so that's the fresh, you know, yeah. with kind of the deep salt there. But also very important, you know, the drinking water standard we call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you say 500 milligram per liter, the error that could cause from fresh to the salty water. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, and maybe that's it seems yeah, kind like, of yeah. Yeah, big then, you know, yeah. Yeah. Right there, but yeah. Hmm. I mean, answer to that, maybe, you know, it's fresh water. <laughs> so, why would but that kind of, you know, you just somehow need it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is one of those from your experiences. Have you done any regional models that? Could shed any light on this proposal? Have you done Let's see about like it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, this is not the first time a regional saltwater intrusion modeling effort has has happened. So, if, if if any of you are aware of what other people were able to achieve on the calibration side, you know, we would, you know, we'd, we'd love we'd love to hear it. <laughs> but we're 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 struggling a little bit. We want to get something that's good and we want to get something that's achievable, but we also don't want to overshoot. So I think, you know, this sounds reasonable to me, but when we get in the middle of it and roll our sleeves up, I don't know what we're able to actually achieve. And it could be that we can achieve this, but it's going to take two years worth of time to get there. 
And we don't have that time either. And so, uh, Dr. Graham, I think you raise a really good point. What do we need for planning purposes? My guess is we don't need anything that what's on the screen, but I think we want to do as best we can. But we really, until we really roll our sleeves up and get in the middle of this, I'm not sure we know what we could actually achieve. And that's, I think that's another reason why coming back to you all um, in, in a couple of months, maybe we can get a preliminary feel of how is the model performing? You know, what, what are we seeing as uh, initial error bands and what looks reasonable? And then it, it, it gets back to how good can we get the, the water levels and the hydraulics? Because I think if we can do good on that, I think there's a better chance for us getting to the water quality side of that. But we're, we're struggling with, with what's, what do we want to get to and what's, what's actually achievable at this scale. And it's just not something we've done before. And what is the main forcing here? Is it sea level rise or is it over pumping? I mean, what is it that you're worried about in your planning? Is it well upconing to do with pumping or is it like a pulse problem or a it's potential problem? intrusion, especially like when we bring in when we come into the planning side of things and we're doing the planning runs, we've already seen some utilities having to totally abandon and buy bulk water from someone else because of saltwater intrusion. So we need to be able to see what's going to happen when I bring in 20 years of a planning horizon. And then I, if I add in sea level rise and then I add in climate change, what's going to happen to the interface? What's going to happen to it's basically everything? <laughs> I mean, so if you want to know when you cross that threshold, you know, that's yeah. different. Like, what is that threshold and how yeah. sure do you have to be that you've crossed it? I mean, I, I think, you know, again, I'll go back to the Broward County example. It's, and, you know, I, I just don't have the Miami Dade data in front of me. Otherwise, that could be in that category too. But at least for Broward, you know, it's, it's one of the few areas where we do all this coastal saltwater interface mapping. It's one of the few areas where we can actually see movement over a five year interval. And so, if you're asking me, you know, just saltwater intrusion, whether it's related to sea level rise, you know, I'm not really sure, but I know saltwater intrusion is occurring right now in Broward County. And I, I definitely would like to be able to predict, at least there, you know, how, how much worse can it get in the short term? Forget about sea level rise over a five or 10 year period. What, what's happening right now? In terms of this, the impact of that occurrence on on water supply systems right now, and so that I think is more of a shorter term. But but again, compared to some of the other coastal aquifer areas and counties in our area, we're not seeing that. But it's definitely happening down there. So uh, maybe my answer to your question is more you know regional. It's in. Broward and Miami Dade, I have a much greater interest in looking at saltwater intrusion, but over longer term, maybe it's sea level rise and climate change over the entire district and how that might cause that eventually may get to the point where it's causing saltwater intrusion at the same rate as we're seeing right now in Broward and Miami Dade. And so it's it, it's not a simple answer. That's that's shooting from the hip right now, that's how I do. So in this graph on the slide 47, we can't really see it. What is that dark line? That, the, the darker one I think is the is the red line on the graphic and that was the 2019 version of the interface. And what defines the interface? 250 milligrams per liter chloride. So if you're 250 plus or minus 500, that, I think we're back to that. Yeah. You know, well, that no, no, 250 and PDS would be closer to 500. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, it's and so now we're talking about calibration statistics, and that's why I don't, you haven't gotten to the, the, the next slide, have you yet? The other calibration stuff. That's the no, next, the one be it. No, no, keep going. No, keep going the other. No, this way. Keep next one. No. Oh, that's one. Yeah, there you Sorry. go. Yeah. Yeah. Bullet four. Bullet four. <laughs> Where we're talking about 
using the historical salt water interface maps to have plan view. And if we're showing, and there I'm less concerned about the, the numerical value of 250 versus 500, but am I showing movement of the interface over the five year um, horizon that we saw in those maps? And if we're showing that movement, I think that that means that the, the model's functioning appropriately and it's going to hopefully show us some of the problematic areas. But it, in the court, we can do all the statistical calibration we want. If in that period of time we're not showing any interface movement, we've got more work to do. And that's kind of that's kind of how I see it. It'd be interesting too to see if there's a calibration criteria to say, oh, we're off by you know two model cells. We're off by two thousand feet for the for the yeah. So that's our water quality conversation. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so are you going to be committed to this? Like, uh, you feel like they're committed to this after showing it to us? Or? No, no, I think we're, we got to have <laughs> that. We you want your feedback yeah. in terms of what's reasonable? Do you think this is good? Should it be something else? Um, it's not set in stone. I think we're kind of at a point where before we start calibrating, we kind of want to know what we're trying to get, what we're trying to meet. And so it just helps us say, okay, yes, some of these wells are meeting the target. Some of them are so off that we really need to focus on this area. Uh, and, you know, just to, to clarify, you know, I, I would like, I don't, nothing today is a commitment from us and nothing over the next week or two is a commitment from you. I, I think this is one where we pause, we see what we're, where we're going. And when we reconvene in November-ish or so, we can have a further discussion because I mean, we haven't even started this. We don't know if this is achievable. So I don't want to commit to something that's not achievable. And so I, I would prefer to, you know, I don't want to lock in anything at the earliest November and maybe even later than that, depending on how far we get. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's more mm -hmm. research and more discussion about what actually is achievable mm -hmm. or in these areas. I know Broward and Miami Dade have done some density dependent modeling. Um, one, I think Miami Dade might be a sharp interface, and mm -hmm. I think Broward might have been, um, I think, with CWAT. So mm -hmm. I would like to understand what kind of calibration criteria they were able to achieve. I don't and, think Broward uh, used TDS. I can't remember exactly what they did. Okay. Well, whatever, um, whatever they did, yeah. you know, we can we can talk to them and see what they were actually able to achieve is that the GS did the work for them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this thing you're saying right here is as you step through time every month or whatever, you want 80% to fall with the bracket. So you, so you want to know what, if you're in a well that's transitioned, you want to also get that timing yeah. right. Which in and of itself is already kind of a lofty goal, you know. Like I'm, I'm saying, okay, the front's moving through, and I still need it to be calibrated eighty percent of the time. There could be a lag, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we, well, that'll come that'll come out during the oh yeah the water level. And I think we are process. expecting there to be a lag. Yeah, that's probably really going to run out of the problem. We may be able to simulate the front moving, but we could be off twelve months. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so all the statistics cut out. Right. Mm -hmm. oh. And it's interesting to see how well it recedes, mm -hmm. like in a case of like where yeah. it, it may go one way well and not back. Not all the way, <laughs> yeah. And then the last thing is the structure flows. Um, so on the right, you can kind of see all of the structure flow locations right now that we're planning on calibrating to. This is obviously not all the structures that are in the model domain. But we wanted to first focus on the coastal structures. We are planning on adding in the main structures, kind of feeding into STAs or not into the STAs, but out of the STAs into the conservation areas. Um, so I think right now it's about 130 structures or something like that. We may be adding additional ones in. Um, for the actual flow calibration, we are proposing using the same calibration criteria as was used with the um, comprehensive Everglades restoration. The Waxahachie project is one of that. So this was core DAX DEP approved calibration criteria. 
Um, the coefficient of determination, r squared is greater than 0 0.4, Nash Sutcliffe of greater than 0 0.4, and a deviation of volume of plus or minus 15%. So we look at all three um, for each of the structure of flows. And again, same thing. I think it's all dependent on the type of data that I have. One of the things that we noticed is um, in some areas we have data, but it actually turns out that it's not necessarily flow data. And so we kind of work with H and H to say, hey, what's going on with the structure? And they kind of let us know, hey, this is not a good structure to calibrate to. And if that happened, we would probably be dropping some, adding something else in, things like that. So that's kind of the structure flows. And then that the slide that we kind of already talked about, but we like to do what we call top calibration, which is not necessarily um, quantitative, but things that we check for the reasonableness and making sure the model is, is acting and doing everything appropriately or how we would expect it to. And so the first thing is looking at those water budgets. Again, that's where multi-bud kind of comes into play. We like to look at like certain areas, we'll do like a big basin budget. Um, we'll also look at the overall model water budget. Um, one of the things that we actually started doing since ECFTX is looking at our transient calibration. So are we meeting that transient model response? Wet season and dry season, but not only that, to see are we calibrated in the earlier time period as opposed to the latter time period? Um, is there a specific grouping of stress periods where our calibration is totally off? We like to look at that kind of um, model response and things like that. Um, we also only relatively recently started looking at the direction and quantity of flux across our boundaries, um, looking at like GHBs and how much water are we maybe bringing in from outside um, across maybe that northern boundary. Is the direction of the flow appropriate? Is it what we're expecting and what we know to be happening? What about the quantity? Is that something that we're expecting to see? Things like that. And then as Pete mentioned, looking at the saltwater interface making sure we're capturing the movement, whether it's inward or back out um, of the saltwater interface. So that's basically our soft calibration metrics. And with that, to talk about the path forward. So Before right now, on, yes. Um, I don't think you said anything about the spatial resolution of your calibration. Does every model cell have the capacity? I mean, are you zoning or are you, Every cell can be. So we thing. have not considered zoning yet. It's something we kind of talked about to see, um, you know, the urban areas are the ones where we're primarily concerned for the planning, you know, the objective of plant, meeting the planning needs and stuff like that. So we had originally talked about should we zone off the coastal areas and see how we're performing in that area of the model. Um, and things like that, we haven't done any of that yet. Right now, we're just looking at the entire model domain. If it has a monitoring well, we're calibrating to it. But if it doesn't, then we're not. No, I meant the spatial oh. variability of the parameters that you're calibrating. Oh, OK. Um, so how many model cells do you have? I think it's 1,060 by 313 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. It, it's it's a third of a million cells. I'm just wondering. I mean, how much spatial variability? When you do this by hand, it sounds pretty overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, so that's what I meant by zoning. Yeah. Um, Does every cell get its own unique set of parameter values, or is there some plan? No. So, like hydraulic conductivity and things like that. Yes, every model cell has its own. Sure. Parameters. Um, there, yeah, everyone gets its own recharge, its own ET, all of that. Um, you know, I don't, I think there are some, well, I don't know. I know at times there's been in some of our models where we'll set a parameter equal to a value for the entire layer. Um, we haven't gotten that far yet. But that's something like if we if we see that and that's reasonable, then we'll do something like that. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, I mean, clearly the cells that are closest to the interface and then those that are close to public water supply well fields, that is a major area of interest mm -hmm. because 
if we go through this exercise and we show that in 12 years time, the interface in its current position is gonna move <coughs> through public water supply well field. I mean, that would be a major conclusion and we would definitely want to you know, confirm that. So that those would be examples of areas that we would definitely focus on is, is where's the interface and what's its proximity to public water supply well fields. And, 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 and that area, in my mind, is more important than the area that's seven miles to the west, which is some cell in the middle of the water conservation areas. That's clearly not as important in terms of, of making sure that we're doing our best on the calibration side. That's a qualitative way of describing that some cells are more important than others. Let's say when you do your one at a time sensitivity analysis, are you going to be moving all the cells up and yes. down at the same time? Yeah, so basically what, for that one at a time sensitivity analysis, we're just gonna take the array and multiply it by whatever and kind of see whether it's double or whatever we decide to do and just see how sensitive it is. And then we'll mark the locations that are most sensitive to that particular variation. And then we'll go through systematically and figure that out. But yeah, we do it model wide. We don't do cell by cell right now. When we're actually in the process of calibrating, it will be strategically, you know, placed. You know, like um, in some cases, there could be a way that you go by yourself, kind of using a cookie cutter, and then you do for a certain area. But, uh, as far as I remember, for river and drainage and the other conductances, you use some water based. Because uh, we use the same area, and then you have a certain amount of care for it water mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. that works well. And that reduces the number of uh, parameters that you're talking about. That's kind of what I was asking. So, yes. so if you if you have a well that's not well matched, how are you going to decide how far away from that well you need to be? Oh, tweaking. <laughs> <laughs> So our approach has usually been to just kind of, we draw a box around it and then we make sure our changes have kind of worked. And then we go in and kind of minimize the zone and, and smooth everything out and things like that. So um, typically in the past we've, but it's very localized. We try to stay localized for, for specific wells that aren't performing. We try to stay localized instead of doing this broad, um, calibration type thing. Hey, Jeff, mm -hmm. you've done some preliminary work. Why don't you shed a little light for the panel on your, so any preliminary work that you've done, either on calibration, on the water levels or, or water, water quality, there, give us some color commentary on what you <laughs> what you've found so far and what you think it could be areas of concern. What's your, what's your general feel right now? But I think, you know, right now we need to understand, we need to remember that we had existing previous models that already worked reasonably well. So we, we had a good start. We have a good start already here. On the water levels and On flows, the water. not water quality. Not water quality, not at all. Yeah. And so, yes, on the, you know, observed water, water level data. So that all looks, we're still messing with DT recharge issues and we got some concerns there because it's throwing the R squared down um, because we're not getting this, the rainfall variations to get our squared back up high. And so that's like one of the issues with the water level. So, you know, readily observing. On the water quality side, we're actually seeing a little bit more trouble up in the high values. Even though I think on, on, on Anushi's um, uh, slide up there, she had plus or minus 400, I mean 4,000 when we're up in seawater conditions. It's still a little tight. Can you go um, back to that slide? And because in some areas it's eight, the, the TDS is 80,000 or 60,000. And so you get into this that, that four thousand in some areas is, is four plus or minus five percent or something, and, and so we do get trouble up in the in the, in the high end. That's kind of and yeah. and you know, Dr. Graham, I'd like to respond to your earlier comment in light of what you just said, Jeff. Is that you know 
if we're at 18,000 TDS and our criteria is 4,000 and uh, we're at six or 7,000, honestly, I don't really care because if it's already saline, it, right. it's saline. You know, in terms of our purpose of figuring out where, where are the problematic areas where intrusion could occur either from over pumpage or from sea level rise, if it's 18,000 and I'm simulating at 25,000, if it's a problematic area for saltwater intrusion, that's all I really need to know. I, you know, whether it's 18,000 or 25,000, it, of course, I'd like it to be good, but as long as it's telling me the area that's problematic from the planning perspective, which I think was your point, that's really the important thing. And, you know, we would like to be according to the criteria here, but that's it. So if, if that's what your major concern is, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that concern, but that's just me. I'm, 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 I'm trying to go back to talk Dr. Graham's comment, which is, if it's if it's for water supply planning purposes, we're supposed to be. If this model is telling us, hey, you need to be concerned about Pompano Beach because that's the area that either due to overpumping or sea level rise, that's where you know we're going to have pro problems first. And when we go through our twenty year plus or plus planning horizon, that's really what I I need to know as a as a as a planner. And so whether it's you know, right on 18 or if it's 25, the fact that that well isn't meeting our criteria, that's less important to me as a water manager as, hey, I've identified the problematic areas that we need that we need to do something. Maybe we need to build, and because of that modeling effort, maybe we need to build a water control structure over there. Or maybe we need to deliver more fresh water to counteract uh, the sea coming in in that area. Those are the those are the, the, the things that we we're, we're we we can potentially do to kind of counteract that. So in that sense, it met the planning goals, but it didn't meet our numerical criteria. But to me, that's still a victory. Does that, does that make sense? The, the one thing we have not done is, as you kind of also mentioned this, is evaluate the transient nature of the, of the right. investment. We have not done anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. Or we've evaluated the transient structure flows and water levels. We have not looked at that. Yeah, I'd like to add a uh, comment on the water quality. I have been doing some. Uh, actually, you guys, this is suggestion you want you may want to put attention to your initial conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, my experience is the uh, water quality is much slower than the water level mm -hmm. than the model. Mm -hmm. So if your initial country is wrong, you mm -hmm. had a hard time with matching the code. Mm -hmm. right. you know, they, sometimes it's more similar to the like a headline. Mm -hmm. So really, yeah, before you start doing character, you, know, you really pay attention to the yeah. 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 yeah, and we've noticed actually that we've tried like moving around with the initial water quality array, and we found that it actually performed worse um than what we originally had so we went back to the original one and we need to tweak it again so this is yeah sometimes it's still painful it's it's the moment, you know, <laughs> uh i am realizing again jeff's recent comment about uh challenges meeting the transient nature of the water levels a little bit no one has mentioned the orphan parameter which one is it this person? No, that's been up there numerous times. There's one that hasn't appeared that ties directly to what Jeff said. It's a store of I haven't seen it anywhere. I don't think in the whole presentation it's never been mentioned. Right. Well, Jeff, <laughs> tell them what we found about store activity and our other ground remodeling efforts. <laughs> 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 but did you do transport? Yeah, one no. one yeah. number across the whole That's good. Yeah. We did with that. They're not two percent. But that's for Interesting. water levels and fluxes. I think so. All your fluxes, you might find yes. it different. Yeah, but, I understand. Yeah. But it sounds like with the problem you were talking about with not being able to get the responsiveness to the rain could be related to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's actually yes. rain is all. I think it's we think it's more likely than if the rain falls or something like that. Okay. But I mean, it's it's certainly one of the 
the initial parameters that will be, uh, you know, for, for the initial um, um, sensitivity kind of analysis, yeah. Yeah. that is definitely yeah. in there. The, yeah. A specific yield of sensitivity, absolutely. Yeah. No question about that. But we have, I mean, again, just from the flow model perspective, we've looked at that parameter and it was insensitive. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. It's really surprising. Yeah. In Miami Day, you know, they calibrated on that as one of them and it, it came out awful. It's a bullseye plot, basically, around wells, you know, that uh, mm. the adjustments were made there mm. to make them match to calibrate better. You know, this doesn't look, it's not natural. Right. So. I'm surprised that you're not finding it more sensitive. Okay. Well, in the other forward models, I think the, the um, I believe it was a longitudinal disk for simply reasonably sensitive. Yeah, for the low risk was good facility and uh, that we used it. Hmm. So, so what numbers are going to use for this model for longitudinal this facility? Some people, you, I, I saw a number from a 10 feet to a 5,000 feet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we're probably going to start in the 500 to 1,000 and go from that. It's scale uh, dependent. So we yeah, need to yeah. take a look at that. I think the first thing we're going to do is work on the groundwater levels and flows. Mm -hmm. We're going to nail the hydraulics part of the calibration first and if when we're comfortable with that I think spend a little bit more time on the water quality but if we don't get the hydraulics right we'll never get the water quality right I think we're pretty convinced about it so you mentioned Broward County is the one that's seen the change in the interface yeah, and Miami day too but you know we don't USGS does the mapping for them this is the data that, that we're and have they looked at drivers for that I mean has anybody said this is sea level rise, or this is pumping, or you know, I think that would also. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how well you get those drivers I, right? I think I think they. I don't recall exactly. I I think they determined that some a a general decrease in water levels to the west has minimized the driving force of groundwater flow from west to east. And that's and the those lower levels related to development have resulted in um, um, salt intrusion. In Miami Dade, you know, it's mostly the canals and the well, the wells have all been moved further back. Broward has a lot of its wells close to the coast, but in Miami Dade, the wells are generally further back, and it's the canal structures and the once they put those in, they've been actually doing a really good job of controlling solid intrusion for decades. There's some places where it's still happening to some extent, but uh, by and large, they've got it sort of under control for the moment. But, uh, it seems like getting those drivers right is yeah. really important. Yes, the, 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 the inland movement of saltwater in Broward is, real, is, especially in the southern portion, is related to where the control structures are, salinity right. control structures. In the north, in Deerfield and Pompano, they're real close to the coast. In the south, by Fort Lauderdale and south of there, they're very far inland, like north of the river canal, it's way, way inland. And back then, they did that because anything to the east has ocean access. So all of those properties, all of those properties on the North New River Canal, those are all ocean access and so the property values went up. So that was, I, I wasn't, I didn't make the decision of where to put those in, but <laughs> obviously, but I think that had a, a lot to do with it. And you can see right where that, the furthest inland red line is, right there is the control structure. And so you can yeah. you can see that when the control structures hug the coast, they do a much better job of preventing inland intrusion, intrusion as opposed to those in the South where they're much further inland and, and the interface has moved, moved in, inland. It's it's like a one to one correlation there. My concern will be when we have sea level above instead of resource structure. Yeah. Well, I know 
the, the question came up earlier regarding Broward County. Um, they did use um, measured chloride data, milligrams per liter, for their countywide bottle calibration. What did they use? Measured chloride data, mm -hmm. milligrams per liter. But what was their calibration criteria? Um, hopefully, she might. They might respond. <laughs> <laughs> Because the comment came through on the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so where we kind of are right now is finalizing all of our input data, our initial water quality, looking at our initial, where are we with the model calibration process? How does the model actually look when we run it? Um, and so of course, where the peer review happens is during our input data and model calibration phase. And when we wrap up um, final calibration, get the documentation up and, and wrap up the peer review process, that's when we would be moving into the model application. So um, kind of path forward wise, I think we're gonna take back a lot of the feedback that we got today, look at um, you know some of, some of the different things, whether it's CWOT code or getting our initial conditions correct, and kind of seeing where we are with the model calibration. And I think we're hoping to kind of come back in a couple months um, and, and show you, we're going to, it's going to be like a Zoom meeting um, to kind of show you where we're at, um, get any feedback, hopefully kind of nail down that calibration criteria at that point so that we can kind of in earnest start calibrating the model, um, get us to where we feel like it's as good as it's going to get and then bring you back again for what we hope will be the pencils down calibrating meeting um, we're targeting March. Um, so I think basically how the peer review process works is we meet, we kind of go over everything, whether it's calibration strategies and whatnot, and um, you all will kind of get together and, and write up a summary of what you think of what we presented today. Um, we're hoping to get that from you in the next like 30 days. And then um, again, I'll be in touch in terms of how we can schedule the next meeting and then scheduling that, uh, moving, you know, getting together, meeting on, on those things. Again, 30 days to kind of give your feedback on that and so on and so forth. Um, wishing as a chair, you would be kind of compiling everybody's comments and sending, um, sending I guess, the report of comments um, over to us again on the web board. Um, and so that's kind of what we're thinking for the path forward. Um, you know, I think we're all aware of how daunting this task is, and it is going to be a lot of work, but we're hopeful that, you know, we can kind of stick to our schedule and get it done, mostly because the Lower East Coast plan is due to come out next year, and we want to be able to use this model for that. So with that, um, we will formally open it up to the panel discussion, which we've done a lot of. Yeah, by the way, this uh, first, uh, do you have any like a uh, documentation regarding your conceptual plan, your, your plan? And most of the things talk about today, do you have an MCD? We haven't actually drafted up um, true documentation of what we've done. We have obviously all the shape files and things like that. Um, everything that kind of went into building this presentation, we have hand. So we can get that information to you, but we didn't type up a conceptual model document or anything like that. I think really today's PowerPoint is it's kind of lays out the overall yes. plan. Yeah. And it's all you know, that's the end scene in PDF already. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, so another thing is, uh, is anyone going to write a meeting a minute? Today, yeah, so yeah, we've okay. been kind of taking notes. Um, I think we'll probably get together, start writing things up, and then um, we'll probably circulate it into your, internally, make sure we get everybody's feedback right. and comments, and then we'll post that available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll add our comments, but uh, make yeah. sure you know we're on the same page. Yeah, okay. yeah so yeah. I forget exactly, it's been a while since we wrote the scope. I, I think. At the at the end conclusion of the kickoff meeting, the panel would prepare some sort of a initial memo of, mm -hmm. you know, here's what we heard, and here are some initial thoughts. Right. And then maybe 
you know, we would do the same thing in November to see if, you know, for, you know, at that point we would provide, this was supposed to be a two day meeting. It was only a one day meeting. And actually I think it worked out better because I think it's going to space out, you know, our progress. And I think we're going to have more to share in terms of our preliminary progress and maybe we'll be able to refine some of our calibration targets and things like that. So, and maybe, you know, after we do our, our meeting summary, we would share that with you. And then some doesn't have to be anything extensive, just some preliminary thoughts as to where you think we can uh, focus on recognizing that we'll be convening again um, remotely in November, <laughs> giving you our progress based on some of the things you've shared with us. And then again, maybe a, a memo of some kind at the conclusion of the November meeting to have any additional thoughts for us to consider. Yeah, I think so, it's like a show. I think maybe you know highlights more of the concern question. So, yeah, and you know we don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> we don't forget. So I'm looking at just to be sure what you're expecting. It says um, each panel member will transmit his or her comments to the web board, to the panel chair, and the panel chair will merge the comments and consider. So. Yeah, yeah I will have your comments and uh, we'll, we'll it, discuss later. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, the first one, will I see the memo? No, no, no. Okay. no. So, we want to see the memo first of all, for the topic, the main topic that we need to come now or we need to input and then to, 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 to that. So, you're saying we would wait to see that? Uh, yeah. I yeah, write yeah, my notes yeah. tonight, so I don't know that, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you, however, you know, yeah. whatever works, I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. It's, uh, it's fresh in your mind. It's, it's fresh in your mind. But, you wanna, but that doesn't mean when we see your stuff, we may tweak it. I like that. Yeah, idea. yeah, yeah. Also, you can just start typing up, you know, yeah. the highlight, highlight points we can share. And uh, so I just don't want to miss any important yeah. you know, points that we talk about today. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's been a lot. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Have you thought anything about precipitation change, ET changes as a result of temperature, maybe as a driver for decreased recharge, increased saltwater intrusion, or is it specifically sea level rise here? So we have talked about in the future, after we're done with tackling the water supply plan, to look at climate change. Um, however, we happen to do that. I don't know whether that's going to be like a rainfall. Um, but you said you weren't going to do sea level rise here, right? Or yeah. So, let, so let, me, let me give you the the the, the plan. Is that I should keep my eye on the clock and not talk much more. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it won't be. It, it, this uh, it won't be. It's me. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, so what your involvement is to get us to the conclusion of calibration that we have a, a peer reviewed calibrated model. And then from that, we have a, a typical scenario, two scenarios where we do a base condition 2021, whatever. 2020. 2020, we'll do a, a base condition run um, with the, the historical water demands that happened in 2020. And then we will, we, the, the planning group develops estimated water demands um, in 2045, and we'll do that run. And we'll look at the differences between the two and, and identify areas of concern and whether we can actually meet those demands under various conditions. In addition to that, we will do one run that actually looks at sea level rise uh, within, within the, the context of the water supply plan, which is due uh, a little more than a year from now. When all of that is done, we're going to have a follow up set of scenarios that look beyond the 20 year planning horizon that the state of Florida require us to look at for, for water spot planning purposes. That's the stuff that uh, Dr. Moran has been working with us on. And we'll be looking at, you know, probably at least one, if not an additional sea level rise scenario. And then also um, some sort of a climate change scenario where potentially that results in, uh, in you know, different ET that we're having right now, perhaps uh, drier than normal dry season and wetter than normal wet season. We will we'll work with her because she's got a, she's gonna have a, a planning process outside of the LEC plan where we talk about, well, what can we, what can we look at to try to see the future beyond 
the 20 year planning horizon. So we're going to have separate workshops to, to talk about that and, and what that might look like. And assuming it can be done within the context of the East Coast official model, we will be happy to do that. But that's going to be after that's beyond 2023. That'll be that'll be after that. And that will probably address you know what you just said. Is that get that right? Does the panel have any other questions or comments for today? I don't believe I do. Uh, no. All right. And I guess this wasn't recorded, was it? It was. It was. So if we yeah. wanted to or needed to, we could we can go back. Yeah, go back. You would see the whole day's presentation. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. It's on YouTube or something? It's on YouTube. It'll be yeah. on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, um, we now with the um, panel discussion concluded, we would like to open it up once again to the public for comment. Again, if you're participating um, via Zoom, uh, you can use the raise hand feature. If you're on the phone, star nine raises your hand and star six moves on each line. Uh, when you are called on, please state your full name and affiliation prior to providing comments. And I will await to see if anybody raises their hand. How many people are logged in from the outside right now, David? 18. Oh, Drop a mark. You win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nothing. I am not seeing anything coming through. Okay. Comment wise. So, with that, that concludes our first meeting of the peer review panel for the ECSM uh, model. I want to thank each of our panelists today for participating and providing lots of feedback to us. And we will meet again at the date to be de determined. And um, we'll let you know. Um, and thank you team for all of your hard work and your presentation and have a good afternoon. That concludes our meeting for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Safe trip home. All right.